Today is Wednesday, July 1st, 2020. My name is Carrie Rael. I'm interviewing Luz Sandoval for the Rutgers Latino New Jersey History Project and the University of Texas at Austin's Voices of a Pandemic Oral History Project. Please know, Ms. Sandoval, that this interview will be placed at the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at UT Austin and the Rutgers Oral History Archives. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or discuss, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you would like to discuss, please make sure to bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record your verbal consent. So VOSA's wishes to archive your interview along with any other photographs and documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin, as well as at the Rutgers Oral History Archives. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you choose to donate to VOSAs. So I need your response to these three questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. Okay, okay. First, first one. Do you give VOSAs consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? I do, I, I agree, the consent. Do you grant VOSA's copyright over your over the interview and any other material you provide? I consent. And do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Consent. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I think it cut out. Oh, I consent. Okay, great. All right. Um, one last thing, let me just... Okay, great. All right, so let's begin. Can you tell me when and where you were born? Okay, uh, yeah, I was born on April 26, 1996 at about 11, no, about 9 p.m. at night uh, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, uh, in St. Peter's Hospital. Um, my full birth name, as it is in a certificate, uh, Luz del Carmen Sandoval. Uh, and I was born to uh, Luz Solano and Oscar Sandoval. And what was the neighborhood like growing up? So uh, when I was growing up, I uh, lived in New Brunswick up until I was five. The neighborhood, um, I wouldn't have called it a neighborhood. We were in a complex uh, apartments living across, uh, off of Route 1, right across from the AMC Theater in New Brunswick. Um, and we lived in apartments, but the thing was, we didn't live in an apartment. We lived in the basement of an apartment. Uh, my my uh, cousins, my father's younger brother, lived above us. He had an actual apartment with like rooms and like that kind of things. But underneath was a basement, and we lived there. And so, like, we didn't really, I didn't really interact with the neighborhood kids because our entry to the only entry to our uh, apartment was these glass doors that led to like the back of the building that led to like a parking lot where people held their things, uh, held their cars. And so, the only pe children I interacted with were um, were the uh, a neighboring family who like whose family was doing I think the exact same thing, but I really don't know, and. Uh, they they were boys so like they were a little bit meaner so we didn't really interact with them and then my cousins who lived upstairs so like I don't really remember much about it except for like it being just me and my sister uh my sister's a year younger than me so she was the only person I really interacted with and most of our think time was spent inside um I don't really remember much about it I remember it was being pretty safe for me uh, I remember playing outside and not being a problem um uh, my mom would take us down to like um, this local park a few blocks away and I remember thinking that it looked very different it looked like a suburb even though it was New Brunswick um, and I think it's called Rutgers Village um, there was a school there and there was like a little park there and it, uh, it, it was generally safe I never there was never anything I thought it was bad uh, which is funny because when I told New Brunswick kids uh, New Brunswick heads is what we called them uh, in Rutgers, when I talked to them about that area, they were just like, that area was very dangerous. Uh, it wasn't until like we left uh, that apparently a lot of cops started moving into that area and that's when it became safe. Uh, but yeah, no. Um, and then, so at the age of five, my uh, parents, my father specifically decided that he uh, 
didn't want uh, us growing up in uh, New Brunswick with the New Brunswick education system. And he had learned from his brothers and from uh, people who like he worked with uh, that it was better to live in a suburb. And so we moved to North Brunswick when I was, I, it was actually on my birthday, I was told that uh, it was April 26. Um, I had just turned five and um, we moved to North Brunswick. And I remember the day because I were, uh, there was nothing, we had no furniture. Uh, so the, our bed was a mattress, uh, the, the entire family, the, all four of us. And I remember that I was only anxious because um, the moving truck hadn't come yet and I wanted my tricycle. Uh, and I, and so I grew up here and since I was five, uh, I still live in the same place. Um, and the neighborhood here in North Brunswick was very, um, we were the one of the first Latino families to move in. Um, there was a black family that lived right next door. And actually she had been my preschool teacher um, when I had preschool in New Brunswick. Uh, we didn't know that, that was not planned. Uh, but yeah, but they were affluent. Um, and then like the surrounding area was very like low to middle class um, white people. Uh, the neighbor, uh, yeah, like, yeah, like I would say, low, uh, like upper lower class to middle class people, um, a lot of working families. Um, but yeah, no, we were like one of the first Latinos families to move in. Uh, and I remember uh, my best my best friend growing up, or the person I hung out with the most, was my neighbor. Her name was Amanda. She was white. Um, she came over every day, uh, and we would just play in our house because my mother would never let us go out into the neighborhood. In fact, I remember being really upset because like our house had a gate around it. It still has the gate, and so we were never allowed to leave the gate outside. But other than that. It was pretty quiet. Um, there was a park like in the lunch school that I ended up going to like right down the street. It's like a four minute walk. And so we pl would play at the park. I would say that my childhood in this neighborhood was very much what you would expect of a suburban town with just a very overprotective parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what was it like being the like one of the few Latino families in this new neighborhood? Um. To be honest, I, I don't think I thought about it much, mostly because we were the first, but immediately after, we weren't the only ones. Um, immediately after my family moved in, uh, there was already a Latino family down the street, uh, but we I think they were, they were actually the first. Uh, and their son, one of their sons was the same age as my sister, so he would come over and he would play sometimes. Uh, although my mom, and particularly my father, didn't really like boys around. Um, and then there was a family that moved immediately after us. In fact, we had looked at their house, apparently, but chose this one. Uh, and their, the boy was my age, and he, his mother and his parents worked. In fact, the whole entire household worked, uh, so he was always babysat by my mother every day after school. Um, and so, yeah forgot about Edward um but yeah no uh he uh it was very and then I yeah it was very like I didn't notice it I just noticed that all the adults that I would constantly see you know mowing their lawns or like um coming at a after uh, at a nine to five work day were white um and particularly actually across the street there lived another boy who was uh mormon his family was mormon uh and his father i don't remember what the father did the father was i think um a tech at it like but like up there not like the rest of the little it nowadays um for a company and uh he spoke spanish so my mother so like the fam our families got along um at, but then they moved in second grade to texas um or after second grade to Texas, and then uh, and then a Hispanic family moved in. So like throughout my childhood, more Hispanic families came in. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, most of the neighborhood now is Hispanic. Um, like my neighbors, my neighbor uh, Amanda, uh, Amanda who was white, she uh, about a couple years ago, like the family moved out, and like now there's Latino families. The black affluent family that lived next door to us, like somewhere around when I was like maybe like nine or ten they moved 
no, like even seven, they moved out and then a Hispanic family moved in. Like every single time a white family would move out, a Hispanic family would replace them. Okay. So it was not very much like, I. it wasn't very like, I didn't notice it that much growing up because like it was just another kid. Mm. The only place I really noticed that there was not a lot of Hispanics was in my elementary school or in schooling. And what elementary school was that? I went to Parsons Elementary School from the ages of five to 10. Uh, uh, yeah, kindergarten to 10th grade. Oh, no, to fifth grade. And were you treated differently because you're Latina? No, actually, I was treated differently because I was Mexican. Yeah. Uh, growing, so like, um, uh, I, the very first instances that I remember being shown that I was different were actually brought up to me by other Latinos. Uh, in fact, they were, they were Puerto Rican students. Um, and it was the first time I remember anyone asking me, um, I was in, I think I was in, if I wasn't in kindergarten, I was in first grade. Um, there was this Puerto Rican girl and she came up to me and she said, um, so you're Mexican. And I said, yes, like, this was a fact. Uh, and she said, well, do you have papers? And I remember being really, really confused by it. And I was just like, what do you mean? Do I have papers? Like, what are, what are papers? Like my homework? Um, and she said, no, do you have papers? Like, and I was just like, I, I don't know what you mean. And she's like, well, are you allowed to be here? And I said, do you mean like my birth certificate? Because like, that's the only official paper I knew of my existence. Like, uh, even then I knew that like a, um, uh, a birth certificate was like an official document that it, it meant something. My mom always stressed about it. Um, so, uh, I said, and she's like, she's like, and I guess she was also confused because I guess in her head, like she didn't know what papers meant. She just knew that like there was an association to Mexicans about it. Mm -hmm. um, and she was very like, well, yeah. And I was just like, well, sure. I have a birth certificate it's from St. Peter's, New Brunswick. And then she like left off of that. Um, so like that was like the first instance that I can remember being told I was different or being told that I didn't belong to something um but uh and I remember going home that day and being very confused by it and so I actually asked my father I was just like do I have what are papers do I have them uh and then he just told me that I had papers that my sister had papers that my mom didn't have papers and that he had papers and I said well what are papers and he's just like well like so who gave you your papers um he explained to me that like my sister and me, uh, me got papers because we were born here. And I was like, well, you didn't get, you weren't, you guys weren't born here. It's like, which is like why my mother doesn't have papers. But like, um, he said that he got papers. <laughs> he told me that he got papers um, from President Ronald Reagan, which I only found out in college meant that he got papers through IRCA. Um, but I had thought that President, at, I was like six, I thought that President Ronald Reagan personally gave my father papers. And so for a while, actually, rather ironically, up until like, I've really learned history. I think I was like, maybe like up until like 10, I would say my favorite president was Ronald Reagan, because he's the one who gave my father papers personally. Um, so yeah, that would be it. Um, other than that, like, I'm really, um, I, I, well, I, people who will see the video will can tell that I'm very uh, pale. I'm very light skinned. Uh, for a Mexican, my sister is is not. My father is not, but my mother and I uh, are. And my uh, youngest brother and my other brother. Um, we only we just tan in the sun. Uh, but other than that, we're like really pale. Um, so I didn't face. I don't think I faced the amount of discrimination or was told I was other unless I was around going around with wearing my Mexico shirt. Like um, it was very easy for me to blend in. And I say that also because a lot of the Latino kids did not, were not warm to me. Um, even the Mexican kids who like looked tanner, like you could tell like they were Latino. Um, they didn't always immediately assume me to be a, a friend. Um, I also wasn't very like, stereotypically Latino in, in their minds, uh, and even in my mind, actually. 
um, because I was very studious. Uh, I liked to read a lot. I was very introverted. I liked to be left alone. And I remember uh, I didn't wear earrings. Um, uh, I didn't, uh, I wore like clothing that I would say um, was rather not flattering. I mean, if I was a child, but like they were also very like baggy. Uh, whereas other, the other girls might, uh, I remember like would wear like something that would be very flattering to them. Um, and I remember that like a lot of the Latino girls would be like, well, why do you dress like that? Well, why do you, why don't you talk like us? Why don't you, why, why are you like this? Um, whereas, so like growing up, um, a lot of my friends were white and a lot of my friends were uh, actually uh, mostly Indian kids. So North Brunswick is very unique in that it has a very large immigrant population, but it's also Indian. Um, so like growing up, uh, most of my friends were Indian because they um they were very studious people a very studious group uh so like we, i would always hang out with them because they they were doing their work i was doing their work i needed help they usually could provide it um okay. and uh and yeah so like there was that i don't remember i remember my first friend who was like yeah no it was my first friend who was like really mexican didn't come until i was in second grade and even then like there was just always a, a like a, a difference um okay. but yeah no um I, I wouldn't say i face that much discrimination and when i did it was usually because i had announced myself as mexican and it was usually like the other latino kids which are like i understand now why they did it like they you know like they were probably picked on by the actual white kids who like could see their differences uh whereas i, I you didn't you couldn't tell with me uh mm -hmm. yeah i was very um racially ambiguous. I remember that the same Puerto Rican girl, actually, uh, she um, uh, one time asked me uh, what race I was. And I was very confused by that. Uh, and then I was just like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, are you Indian? And I was just like, no, I'm not. And then I just, I remember promptly turning around. Right. And I was just like, I'm not that either. So, right. yeah. And what are your parents' names? And where were they born? Oh, okay. So my Mother's name is Luz del Socorro uh, Solano Cruz, if I am correcting that, remembering that correctly. Uh, she was born in, actually, uh, I, I actually asked her today and I had gotten it wrong. She, is, she was born in Oaxapan de Leon as well uh, in Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, she was the eighth of 12 children. And in fact, I think she was remembering that she might have been one of the first of her siblings to be born in a hospital. She was born May 13, 1970. Mm -hmm. um, and she, yeah, and she was, she grew up, uh, she, but she grew up, uh, so Oaxapan is a, is a small city. Uh, Oaxaca, the state we're from, it only has six. Oaxapan is one of the six, but it's a small city. Um, and around it, ha like, it kind of has, like, satellite small towns, um, and she's actually from one of those small towns. She's from a, a town called Cuyutepeji, um, which is, like, about 15 minutes drive away from the city, uh, but she was born in the city, uh, but she was raised in Cuyutepeji, uh, up, uh, up until, like, middle school. Mm -hmm. where then she was sent to live with her older sisters in the city to get a better education. Well, actually to get an education because Cuyutepeji Cuyo is so, actually, so it's Cuyutepeji, but it, we just call it Cuyo. Uh, Cuyo is so small that it only has a primary okay. school. And so like afterwards, if you wanted to continue your education, you went there. My father's name is Oscar El Alfonso Sandoval uh, Villa. Villa is the last, second last name. He was born January 23rd, 1967. Uh, his parent, uh, I, I don't know much about, m me and my father aren't very close. So like, uh, I know very basic thing about him. So um, we, uh, I know he was born in Huapan de Leon as well. He was the second boy of eight children. Um, his parents were, I don't know if my grandmother ever had a job grow, or like while he was growing up or she was just a stay at home mom. But I know that his father was a 
professor it was into it was in education he was either a professor at the local university or he was a principal of a good private school in the university school i don't remember which but i do know that he was very um my father's family comes from wealth from what i can tell what i could deduce because um uh, my grandfather uh his name is uh guadalupe papa lupito um he was the leader of the pan in the town uh and i know that I don't know how many brothers he had, but he, I know he had brothers that owned a lot of land in Oaxaca de Leon. Uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> um, my family, my family last name uh, is not well liked from my understanding in our city because how much um, land the brothers have taken and from my understanding, not exactly in the nicest ways. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, my grandfather was not a landowner. He, uh, from my understanding, um my brother my grandfather was seen as one of the good brothers um or because he was not involved in land but he was he was involved in politics um and so i do i do know that uh at least my father my grandfather has a better reputation than his other brothers um yeah and then my grandparents on my mother's side um they were farmers um okay. Yeah, uh, they were farmers. They farmed the land. They had they had land. They had they have they had a huge. They still have a huge amount of land. Uh, in fact, um, most of it is going to go to my mother, uh, even though she's the eighth, because she is the one who currently sends the most money to like to sustain my grandparents. So she is uh, per my grandparents, she will inherit most of the land. Okay, and why did your parents choose to migrate to New Jersey? Oh, okay. So let's see. Um, my parents met somewhere and my mother was like in her like mid twenties and my father was in his like late twenties and they dated for some time. Um, my father, um, as the story goes, I don't really know much about it because again, I, I don't uh, speak to my father that much. Um, he, um, sometime in his, um, sometime in his youth uh there had been an earthquake oaxaca is very um prone to earthquakes and he had a, a friend a close friend pass away during an earthquake and it, i from what i understand it was very traumatizing and um he decided that he didn't want to be there anymore and so um uh, he that it's when his and his him and his four brothers all decided to go to california and work on the farms and through I my understanding is that through living through California and traveling with his brothers at one point or another they they made it to New Jersey and uh they liked it um New Jersey had some Latino roots already uh mostly because of the Puerto Rican and Dominican uh, populations and Cuban populations that had already been here but he seemed to like it um uh and then he went back to Mexico and then he met my mother um they met, I, I, from what I understand, at a, a wedding, because my my one of my mother's older sisters married his cousin, uh, my father's cousin, and so like they met from one of those kind of things. My mother was uh, growing up; uh, she kind of did a lot of babysitting for her older sisters. Uh, so they met. Uh, he, he, I would say he kind of courted her because I think for some time she didn't want to date him um or at least how the, how the story goes and then they dated a, a couple years and then um they got pregnant and i am the oldest of the four so it was me um and uh in mexico it's particularly in southern mexico it's like very rural but it's also very conservative um with some liberal leanings um and the when my mother got pregnant she went to her sisters for help and they told her well you you marry him uh no ifs or buts and so um there they got married uh in december of 1995 uh i think it was the 12th uh and uh i liked and they had a wedding and then immediately afterwards they left for the united states uh my understanding is that because my father had lived in the united states he liked it better he liked the opportunities better he wanted to raise his family there um 
Although I will say with the speed that they left, I, I do sometimes wonder whether it was just to avoid the scandal of what I was. Um, because my grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, Mama Fide, she did not know I existed until the day after I was born. Um, but everyone else knew. Uh, but like my my grandmother, uh, Mama Fide, my mother's mother, she um, she was very religious, mm -hmm. uh, and she, uh, she to the point that actually she didn't want to get married. She had wanted to be a nun. Uh, but then my grandfather saw her in the village and was just like, "I want to marry her," and so she was married. Okay. Off. But yeah, no. So I, if my understanding is that uh, my father saw the opportunities in New Jersey, kind of liked it here. He had. Uh, he had a brother, his younger brother, uh, Cesar, who um, kind of already had a little few roots here with his own fa wife and uh, uh, family. And it was just, it was just decided that it would be better here. I think it also maybe like the jobs here were more about um, working in service. So my father uh, was a waiter at like hotels. Uh, whereas if it had been in California, it felt like a lot of the labor was going to be more, was going to be uh, uh, agricultural. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it, it just felt better, like, to go to New Jersey. And what did your mother do for work when she migrated to New Jersey? She actually didn't work up until I was about nine, when she got her resident papers. Um, I don't know, actually. I, I suspect it's because my father is also very conservative, like, in family traditions. And so the idea of a wife having to work was mm -hmm. very not appealing. Uh, but also because my father worked at least two jobs working as a waiter, like my understanding was that he made decent amount of money. It wasn't until like later on that like my when my mother got paper specifically, but that my family was just like struggling for money that they they decided that my mom needed to work. Uh, when she started working, she worked in uh, cleaning services because, you know, that's the first place that lets you get in without any education. Uh, she worked at cleaning up the Barnes and Nobles right before it opened in um, in uh, the Brunswick Square Mall. I think it's in East Brunswick. Uh, uh, she would, she, yeah, she had to learn how to drive. I remember when she learned how to drive. Um, she, I was around maybe eight, nine. She learned how to drive because she needed to get to work. Um, uh, she was about 35, uh, which is, which is what I tell her now because I don't drive, uh, even though I live in New Jersey and I need to, uh, I tell her, well, I'll learn when I'm 35, like you did. Um, but no, she, uh, worked in, I remember sometimes going with her and I would just stay in Barnes and Nobles and read because I loved reading. Um, but, uh, and I would wake up early just to do it. Um, then after that, after some time, she decided that she didn't want to do that. She kind of wanted to work with food. Uh, she really liked the idea of food. Um, and she, you know, she was always cooking in the house. So she applied to be uh, a lunch shade with Charleswell's in our local, so in our local district. So our, our, our schools partner with Charleswell's to feed the students. And she uh, ended up working at my middle school about the same time I entered middle school. Um, so that would have been 2007. 2008 was when she first got her first cell phone. Uh, we always remember that because um, the last four numbers of her phone number are 2008. And so we always remember that. Mm. Um, and then she, she worked there for some time uh, in, the, in, the, in the school district as a lunch aide. Um, and then she kind of knew that Rutgers was going to be a better opportunity for her, not only in like pay, but also like she knew of the benefits that Rutgers would give uh, to its student, to the to workers. To, uh, so Rutgers uh, University employs its own people to feed the students. Uh, and so through that, because they are Rutgers employees, they get uh, the benefit of tuition remission. So she knew that if she wanted to put two daughters through college at the same time and not, and I don't know if it's an immigrant thing, but my parents fear debt. Uh, mm -hmm. And they fear debt mostly for me and my sister and, my, and the other, and the, the other boys, uh, my mom in particular. So she, uh, she always told me growing up that if I wanted to go to college, 
um, it would have to be because um, it would have to be a low cost school or I'd have to have a good scholarship mm -hmm. because she didn't have the money. Um, and she kind of understood what financial aid was, but she was still scared that that would never give me enough money to not be in debt. But so she knew that she kind of wanted to work for Rutgers. She had heard it was a good place to work. And then she liked working with food. And then she knew that the benefits would be more beneficial to um, me and my sister and the other boys. Um, so she applied to go to work at Rutgers. She started there working um, part-time because Rutgers doesn't uh, immediately hire full-time staff for these positions. Um, and then she stay, she worked there for about three years um, part time. She would bounce between uh, my uh, middle school and uh, Rutgers just to like work both jobs. Uh, and then eventually Rutgers said, "We'll give you full time." And that's when she quit uh, my middle school and she went to work full time uh, at Rutgers. And what type of food do you remember eating growing up? Like what types of dishes you could describe? Oh, some. So I remember I was very, I was a very picky child growing up. I, which I wish I wasn't, but I was. Uh, so I remember my mom sometimes had to tailor food to uh, get us to eat. Although whenever we didn't want to eat, she would tell us to just, we weren't allowed to leave the table until we ate food. Uh, and then I would just wait until she left the room to like, put the food back into the pot um but so some of the foods is caldo de res um pozole uh pozole is my favorite i will uh, to the end of my life i will say that if i had one meal left it would be pozole uh, my mother green. huh is it red or green pozole oh so my mom makes it green okay. and then she i don't know if that's how um Red or green? I'm, okay, so like, she makes it plain, and then you can add red sauce to it. Uh, because particularly because me and my sister grew up picky, we would not eat spices. We would, if it, um, uh, something that I regret immensely now, uh, not being taught how to handle that kind of heat. Um, but uh, so we were allowed to like add our own to our own taste. Um, and that's how I grew the, uh, I, I do like a pozole with, uh, the red, uh, the red mole. Um, I, yeah, she makes it from scratch too. She makes like, she, she does the whole entire like 12 hours before it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I have to learn how to make that from her. Um, what type but yeah, of meat in the pozole? Oh, um, pollo. It's a uh, chicken. Mm -hmm. um yeah no uh yeah everything like she kind of like made it all like she would make the plain soup and then she would um like radishes rabanos she would like and then like lettuce and then like onions and then like the mole and then the chicken she would always constantly like make that separately so like it'd be like make your own pozole mm -hmm. um usually to accommodate everyone uh because that way everyone can like make their own like to taste mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so like caldo de res, pozole, um, very, uh, oh, I don't, I don't remember everything, uh, but like there's some other things like she would make, um, she would like make, uh, ta she would obviously make tacos like by hand too. Uh, and then there was another thing where like she would like dip tortillas into like, like a sauce of beans and then have like cecina so like i don't know how it's called in english cecina it's like lean steak from what i can understand it uh so she would do that uh there was um there was like caldo de arroz with like pollo uh she, there were just like a lot of things but there was also like a lot of things that i just wouldn't eat so like i remember her making sometimes having to make like i would assume that if we had grown up in mexico this would not have gone down like this uh, but she would make sometimes a, a different dish for me and my sister that she knew we would eat. And then she'd make a different dish for my father and like yeah. other family members that lived with us. And what um, other family members lived with you? So when I was around four, uh, I had my oldest cousin on my mother's side of the family, Carlos, uh, live with us. Sorry, give me a second. I just, I'm up against the wall. It's starting to hurt. 
um, Carlos, he was the oldest cousin on my mother's side of the family. In fact, my mother uh, babysat him and raised him to some extent. Uh, he came when I was four and moved in with us into the house that we live in now when I was around six. And so he, he had a room to his own uh, and he would pay rent. Uh, he also was the waiter uh, in a lot of the hotels that my father worked at. And then, um, and then I had another cousin uh, the old, the other, the oldest of my father's side of the uh, family, Christian, he came when I was around, maybe around seven or eight. Uh, he lived in the basement. Um, he worked in, he got a job in, what was it? It was an, uh, like, uh, landscaping. Mm-hmm. Um, and he got that job because his, father his my my uncle my it was the um oldest of my um the oldest of my father's uh side uh he lived with us too he i don't remember when he lived with us but he uh definitely when i was young uh he, and he had already been working in landscaping so he got mm-hmm. his um son in there and so like they, they lived with us not everyone lived at the same time uh and then uh, when i was about nine maybe eight my mother youngest the youngest brother of my mo- my mom her younger little, her little brother the second to last uh came to the united states and he began uh living here as well and then later on when i was maybe around 10 11 he brought over his uh his girlfriend at the time and mm-hmm. her and their child from mexico okay. Uh, and so, yeah. Okay. And did you grow up speaking Spanish? Or... Yeah. Okay. And um, so did you speak Spanish first or um, English first, or did you learn both at the same time? Uh, Spanish was my first language from my uh, from what my parents told me. Uh, up until I knew English uh, because my cousins, uh, my cousins who like lived upstairs from us uh, in in New Brunswick they um they spoke English they were older than me uh Mm -hmm. so uh, the boy was two years older than me uh the oldest girl was five four years older than me Mm -hmm. and then there was another a girl another girl who was two years younger than me um and they spoke English because they had already entered the school system uh, and so we spoke English with them, but with my parents, we always spoke Spanish to this day. We still speak Spanish to them. Um, it was my first language and I didn't really speak, start speaking English a lot until I went into like school, uh, preschool, mm-hmm. preschool, I, I learned English. Uh, and then, you know, because I was watch, always watch cartoons, Dora the Explorer spoke English. So Luce spoke English. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but I, I spoke English well, but actually when I went to Parsons, um, they immediately uh, put me into uh, ESL, uh, English as a Second Language program, which they had, um, and um, they uh, they put me in there because they assumed I didn't know how to speak English. Mm-hmm. But really, I I just was shy and I didn't want to speak to anyone. Mm. Uh, so they but they assumed that because of that I didn't know how to speak English. And so up until I was in second grade, the end of second grade, I still stayed in the ESL program because um, by the time, by the time I was in first grade, I knew I didn't belong at the program. Like I knew more English than all the other kids. Um, But I had realized that if I had ESL, I didn't have to do writing class. So I purposely failed didn't I didn't care I didn't care when I took the, the the exam like they would take make us do an exam every single at the end of every um uh year uh to determine whether or not I had learned English or not and mm-hmm. I would remember I remember specifically um not wanting to take the exam not caring about it and so I would not re- even read the questions and I would just give answers or circle things and so I failed and um they they were just well she still needs so in second grade was when the jig was up uh because my sister had entered as well so they were like oh well they're sisters they probably don't know english because she doesn't know english um only my sister did graduate because she actually took it seriously she graduated after kindergarten 
Um, and in second grade, um, I remember that I specifically loved ESL because like they would not, they wouldn't like, they, what was it? They, they, they would take me out of writing class and I didn't like mm -hmm. writing. Okay. Uh, and uh, one day as we were walking, because um, so the ESL kids um, had trailers outside of the school. So we'd had to walk outside of the school to like go there. Uh, and they were separate classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and they, there was two ESL teachers at the time, the one I had and the one my sister had had. And the one my sister had had saw me and knew that who, that, uh, who my sister was. And she's just like, why are you here? And I was just like, what do you mean? And I was just like, she's like well, and she looked at the teacher and she said, her sister passed a year ago and she's smaller. And they kind of looked at me and I was just, I didn't know that the jig was up, but they made me retake and he told me that to take it seriously this time. And I did and I and I passed because of course I passed. Right. Um, and so that's how I got out of ESL. Yeah, that's, said, that's, hmm? oh, I was gonna say, you said you um, like to read a lot as a child. Was uh -huh. college something you always wanted to attend? Yes. Because okay. when I was four years, no, when I was three years old, me and my sister had this um, Barney book, Barney the Dinosaur uh, book, but it was about the Triceratops. Don't remember her name. Um, and in the book, it was like this small child's book. Like it was like 10 pages max. Um, each page, the dinosaur would play pretend and she would pretend to be what she wanted to be when she grew up, either a doctor or a veterinarian or, or a zookeeper or a teacher or a ballerina. And I remember specifically that one day I told my sister, she had to be younger than me. She was a year younger than me. Um, we should pick our careers from mm -hmm. this book, uh -huh. uh, this child's book, um, because I knew I would one day grow up and I had to choose. So why not now? And she, and I told her I wanted to be the ballerina and she told me that she wanted to be the ballerina and we got into a small argument that I gave up at and I said, okay, fine, you'll be the ballerina. And then I flipped through, I was like, what else is appealing here? Um, and I found teacher. And since that moment, I only ever wanted to be a teacher. And so when I would go through school, I would always ask my teachers, how did you become a teacher? Uh, specifically, it happened in fourth grade because there was a teacher who I loved the most. Mm -hmm. her, her, I don't remember, I think her name was Mrs. D. Bernardis, but mm -hmm. uh, we just call her Miss D. Um, she was, I really liked her. And so I asked her how she became a teacher. And she said, uh, I went to college. And I said, oh, so if you're going to go to so if you want to be a teacher you got to go to college and since that moment i was just like well college it is um and i also kind of knew like my mother went she didn't go to college but it was her biggest regret not going to college mm -hmm. she got the chance to go to college in, at the local university in um Wohapan, but she wanted to do something else with her life so she tried to go to a different college but in mexico the the school education for college is kind of vastly different it's not like here where you can go wherever you want it's more like the states have universities and if you're a resident of that state you are guaranteed a spot if you have the grades right but if you want to go to a different state, you have to have better grades than what they want. And she did not have that, but she still tried. And so, so she, so she regrets not going to college. She ended up going to a, like a technical school, but um, she always told me and my sister that if we wanted to do anything, like we had the opportunity to go to college and that that was another thing. Mm -hmm. She didn't push us to do anything specific, but like mm -hmm. our parents kind of made us seem like college was like the only thing because that was the greatest thing about the United States, the, the opportunity to go to uh, higher up education. Um, so like that was also like me telling my parents, I want to go to college was not like, it wasn't a deal breaker. It wasn't like, it was just more like, how are we going to get to that point financially? Uh -huh. But yeah, no, um, I, and then, yeah, since fourth grade, I, I didn't, it didn't come up until like, maybe like, middle school was very like, who cares about anything? Because I was a preteen and, only the only thing that mattered was really what I was watching and uh, my friends. But in high school, after freshman year specifically, I was just like, okay, how do I? Because my freshman year of high school didn't go down academically as well as it should have. 
Uh, but I was very much about, okay, how do I turn this around? Because college is afterwards and mm -hmm. I'm not guaranteed a spot almost had the grades. And so I, uh, I had a teacher, Mrs. Tannis, uh, who was Dominican Haitian descent immigrant. Um, sh and she, uh, she took kind of a shine to me, uh, particularly after I sassed an older Indian friend. Uh, no, he was a month older, but I was taller and older. Um, so she took a shine to me and she, uh, she was the one who was very much like, well, you need to take the SATs. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to take the ACTs. Uh, you need these grades. Um, she was very honest with me. She would be very much like, um, I'm not grading you on a regular scale. I'm grading you on your scale. And I would ask her, well, what does that mean? And she said, well, on a normal scale, you would be an A plus student. But on your scale, I know you're giving me B papers. And so she would constantly push me to do better. Um, she would sometimes um, give, like, there would be, like, options to read, but then she'd be like, no, you're reading this, though. Okay. Uh, so she was very much the one who pushed me. Um, and, and yeah, I remember specifically, like, a lot of, like, besides her and uh, two other English teachers in the Department of English of my high school, I was very much, like, everything I, had, I learned about going to college was about, was on me. Like, mm -hmm. I was the one who did research, um, what the SATs were, how do I not pay for them because I don't like I, my parents paying for a test was very um, outlandish. Mm -hmm. um, very much about well, what kind of GPAs do I need? Well, what are college essays? Um, very much about it. In fact, I remember my freshman year, at the end of my freshman year, I remember going to the guidance counselor because supposedly the guidance counselors were there to like help you with your future career college plans. And I remember her. I was going into the office and her not really giving me like much information at first when I was like, well, I want to go to college. And she was just like, she kind of looked at me like, are you sure? And I told, and I remember, uh, this was like one of the first of many times where I would go into the office, not really asking for help because I already had done the research more like, I'm asking her like, well, does this research look right to you? Um, because she, I remember being uh, her being like, I was like, well, you want to take, I want to take the SATs. And she's like, oh, she kind of like looked surprised that I knew what the SATs were. And then she was just like, okay. And I was like, and I want the waiver. And was like, because I know I, 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 I get the waiver. And I was just kind of being there kind of almost like telling her what I wanted, not really asking her for advice at that point. Um, but uh yeah, no, actually, now that I really think about it, my guidance counselor was my biggest obstacle because she, uh, the guidance office um, in particular, because I guess if, now that I'm really thinking about it, any discrimination I did face in high school came from the guidance office. Um, they were very, um, they didn't, the, the motto in North Brunswick among the students was, if you actually want anything get, get done in North Brunswick high, Township High School, you bring in your parents. And this was a very, like, it was very known. Like, if, if something's wrong with your schedule, if something's wrong with, like, your classes, if there's something wrong with the teacher, you bring in your parents. But the problem was looking around at, like, me and my other, like, the other Latinos around and looking at, like, the kids of low income. Like, who has the parents? Like, I, I knew I could never bring in my parents. Like, my mother, my, I wasn't speaking to my father by that time. And um, because we have a strange relationship. Um, but my mother, like her English was very like, not to the level that she would have felt comfortable coming in and defending my my academics or my grades or my honor. Mm. Um, so that was like a no-go, um, which is also why I think I became a teacher's pet to an extent, because those were the people who actually like vouched for me. But even then they, they had limited power. I remember that there was an instance where um, my teacher, the, actually the very same teacher who uh who encouraged me uh mrs tannis she uh recommended me to for honors but because she had because she had set the uh, expectations on me it meant i usually handed in like b plus a minuses because she always th thought my rank could do better um the guidance counselors looked at me and she said and they said uh something along the lines of like we don't think you'd excel in honors it, we think it'd be a lot easier for you to just stay where you are um you're very lucky to be where you are 
And I, back then I had absolutely no backbone and I didn't realize like the racial connotations of what they were saying to me. Uh, it was actually my teacher who was furious, but also because I was in high school and I had friends to worry about, I had boys to worry about, I had all these things to worry about that weren't actually really important at the time, but were everything then. Um, I didn't fight it. Uh, and I was also very much like, oh, why fight something? Like, what? why wouldn't the system know what's best for me? It was my teacher who was mad. Like, she was angry that um, she said, oh, how would they know? They only see a number. They don't know your worth ethic. Um, but I didn't fight it. And I stayed in class, uh, in the same class. Um, and, but yeah, no, I... I remember constantly going to them and uh, whenever I needed advice, I didn't really need advice. I was just asking them like, well, does this look correct to you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I and then my senior year, I I wanted to be with the same teacher, Miss Tannis again. Um, and I remember that like that was the year that they made it. Um, they like prior to that year, they um, they would let you change your schedule the day or the week of for the first week. But that was the year they were just like, no know that you're not allowed to anymore like that's the schedule you get is the schedule you got um and I just remember um not liking my schedule and so I went to my teacher Miss Tannis because I, like, I want to be in your class you you push me I know I'll get into college with you and because we had already had the experience of like guidance the guidance counselors not being particularly uh keen to help me uh she went above their heads um to her department head uh I think his name was Mr. Santa Maria. And she had me sit down with him and I had to explain to him why I wanted her to be my teacher and not my current teacher because I was just asking for a teacher switch at that point. And I explained to him uh, what what I, I, I thought. I was like, Miss Tannis pushes me. She doesn't give me the easy way out just because I am well, uh, I do well or mm -hmm. I'm quiet. I had, a, I had a lot of teachers who would tell me like, oh, you're so quiet. I wish you, uh, the other kids were like like you. But like Miss Tannis obviously didn't do that to me because Miss Tannis was, was black. She, she kind of, she saw me for me on uh, an extent. Um, and so I explained to him and then he, <laughs> he gave me a pass and he wrote on the pass. He said, go bring this to your guidance counselor and tell, and tell him what you want, tell her what you want for your classes, for your schedule. And when she says no, tell her that I override her. And I did, I, I, I was so scared. I remember going there like, what? Um, I was just so scared uh, because I was very a quiet kid. I didn't like stirring trouble. And uh, they, um, I went to the guidance counselor and I told her the same spiel that I wanted these classes. And um, she told me no. And I told her, well, I had this pass from Mr. Santa Maria and, said that, and he told me to tell you that he overrides you. And I remember her face going so pale. Like she was already pale, but she was pale. And she took the note. And then, and then a minute later, I had the schedule I wanted, the classes I, the class I wanted. And she said, "Well, is there anything else you want?" At which point, I was just like, "Yeah, I actually, I want. I, I changed my whole schedule. I was just like, this is exactly how I want it." Um, and and then I walked out thinking, "Is I actually walked out thinking, is this what the rich kids in the school deal with?" Like, well, no wonder they're all happy. Mm. Um, because because I remember that, that particular week, like a lot of students, a lot of like my regular classmates um, didn't get their schedules changed. Mm -hmm. um, and But I remember like among my friend group, there was this one girl, um, she, her, she was rich. I remember, well, she was well off, upper middle class. Um, and her father was a lawyer. And I remember that on the first day of classes, she threw a fit over her schedule. Uh, and then within the hour, her father had shown up to the school and mm -hmm. she had gotten the schedule she wanted. Okay. Her, she, and I, I remember I remember really resenting her for it because I was just like, how's that fair? Right. Oh, supposedly there's a rule for all of us that we are not allowed to change our schedule. Mm -hmm. But again, it, it was that motto in North Brunswick among like among my peers that uh, if you want anything changed in North Brunswick, if you want anything in North Brunswick, you you bring in your parents as students. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and so I got that teacher 
and she helped me get into college. She helped me write her my essay and she looked at my ACT scores. I remember mm -hmm. that um, I had applied to Rutgers and I applied to College of St. Elizabeth. Uh, what made and, you choose to go to Rutgers? Oh, so Rutgers, Rutgers was like the only school I was interested in because it was like right in New Brunswick. Uh, so like I had a, my little brother was four at the time. I didn't want my little brother. Yeah, no, he was around. Yeah, he was around three to four at the time. Um, and so I didn't want to like leave him because I, I my little brother is the person I consider myself uh, very responsible over. Um, and during high school, I um, raised him a lot. Uh, my because my mother would work often long hours and my father was really not in the picture at the time um due to his like alcoholism uh so he so i raised i me and my sister raised our little brother we like to say that um well we don't like to say it but we say that um we gave up a lot of our high school to raise our little brother i remember that i wanted to do uh clubs and i wanted to do sports uh but i couldn't because there was a little brother to raise mm -hmm. um and there was a house, house to keep up. And so uh, I didn't want to leave him. I didn't mm. want to like um, go. And um, yeah, no. And so that's why I wanted Rutgers. Also, most of my friends were going to Rutgers and everyone everyone in North Brunswick kind of just ends up at Rutgers. The people mm -hmm. who leave don't go to Rutgers are the people who are just like, like who are just kind of like, they tend to like say, they kind of see it down uh Rutgers is going like almost like going to another high school with the same people but it's not but I understand why they see that because like during my time at Rutgers sometimes I would like turn the corner and I'd see someone from high school and I'd be like good god gotta mm -hmm. go mm -hmm. um but yeah did no your mother did your mother working at Rutgers also influence your decision or was she working at Rutgers by the time you got admitted she was working at Rutgers by the time I got admitted, but that's because I didn't immediately go to Rutgers. Okay. So I um, I applied to two places, College of St. Elizabeth, Rutgers. I applied to College of St. Elizabeth just because I got a, like a flyer in the mail and it told me I, it waived the, um, admis the admission uh, application fee. And I was just, and I we didn't have to write an essay. And I was like, cool, because uh, I don't really like writing a lot. Uh, and so I, I ended up going there because they gave me a nice scholarship. Uh, the only problem was that it was exactly what the opposite of what I wanted. Um, I had to like move an hour away um, from my family, which was hard. Um, but um, by the time, so like my mom had already had already been working part time at Rutgers. During this time, she was part time, which meant that she got no benefits. Um, to be honest. Um, I wouldn't, I would say like maybe 20% of the uh, the reason I wanted to go to Rutgers was because of my mother. But at the time, like it wasn't even a possibility uh, because like she didn't have the tuition remission. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was kind of pure coincidence that by the end of my year at College of St. Louis, I didn't want to be there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I was homesick all the time. Um, I was also very like the problem with College of St. Elizabeth was besides College of St. Elizabeth was at, at the time was an all girls school. Uh, so that was a problem to me. Um, it was also very tiny. And the thing also was that because it was all girls school at the time, they had a low uh, enrollment problem. And so the thing was, they would enroll a lot of girls from like, inner city schools. Um, the problem was that a lot of these girls because they were inner city girls or because they didn't really know much about like the college experience or more like the college like levels they wouldn't be up to standard i would say of entering a, a college that was supposedly held a lot of prestige mm -hmm. um so a lot of like the standards were lowered to the point where like i was put into honors programs but um, the honors programs really acted like a, like a regular level kind of uh, middle of the ground kind of like level. And I had a problem with it because th at the end of my, by the end of my, of like, by the beginning of like, by the end of my first semester uh, at St. Elizabeth, but also at the beginning, um, I was handing in, I was not okay, I was depressed. And I was handing in like C to B level papers. Like I knew those were terrible papers, right. but I was getting A's on them. Uh -huh. 
to the which is why I, I knew that the standard was low because I was just like if I handed it to Miss Tannis, Miss Tannis would have asked me what the what was wrong with me. Right. Um, and then there was a one point where I handed in a B paper. I remember it was I, it wasn't even a B. It was probably a C plus paper. And I got an A minus on it. And the honors teacher was my my writing teacher. The honors director was my teacher. Um, and she told me very, I, she told me very kindly um, that she had nothing else to teach me, that it was a good paper and she had nothing else to teach me. And I remember thinking, I cannot be here. Right. So um, transferred to Rutgers. So I transferred to Rutgers. I had, uh, I, the standards were so low that I had a 4.0 that I would say I did not deserve. Okay. Um, my, I was not okay. Uh, I had very low motivation to do things. So I know I would, was that was not up to par. Mm -hmm. um, but with my 4.0, I was just like, this is, this has to get me into Rutgers. I have to leave. Um, and the thing was that a lot of, I wasn't the only one, like there were, uh, I made, my first Latina friends were, true friends were made at that school because we all had the same problem that we were very well prepared for college, but the standard that St. Elizabeth was giving us was just not to standard. And so like a lot of girls, like a lot of girls left after their first year of college at St. Elizabeth. Um, and so I knew they were leaving. So there was nothing for me to be there for. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I, I knew I wanted to go to Rutgers because all my friends were at Rutgers. Uh, it would be closer to home. I would live at home. And and then my mom told me I got full time. And it was and it was done. I I I handed in the application. Um, and I I was gone. I, I I remember that my teachers were very much like it was a very small school, so they knew, all knew me. Um, they all kind of really loved me. Um, I, I, sometimes I wonder if it was more like, because I was a novelty, uh, because I was clearly Mexican. I would tell anyone I was Mexican. I wear a Mexico sweater everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but I was very smart. Well, not that other girls weren't smart, but like I had to try less to, to please the teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they even asked me, they were like, Luz, why didn't you make your schedule for next year? And I had to tell them, even though I didn't want to, I was like, I'm not coming back next year. And they thought it was money reasons. And I was just like, it is. Um, my, my parents, uh, my mother has tuition remission. I don't have to pay for school anymore. Right. Uh, so what was and your so, major when you went to, and why did you pick it? My major was history. Okay. Uh, a college of St. Elizabeth with the intended minor of secondary education. Mm -hmm. I, again, back going back to like, the dream uh, to teach, uh, I had finally settled that I wanted to teach high schoolers. Uh, I wanted to teach high schoolers because, and I wanted to, because I, I don't want to pick favorites among children because I thought that was very detrimental to their health and I would 100% pick favorites. Mm. Uh, middle schoolers, I thought were a tumultuous bunch that I was just very much like, I could not handle all those hormones and their education. Mm -hmm. I thought that high schoolers would be very more like stable. Okay. Uh, for whatever reason, which is completely wrong too. Uh, but I also wanted to learn high, uh, teach high schoolers in history because I loved history. I loved reading history. But there was also an issue where I felt even as a high schooler that I was not seeing myself in my history books. Mm -hmm. uh, my freshman year of high school, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, do an elective by uh, a Puerto Rican teacher, um, which was Latin American history. But even that to, even during high school, I, I always would think, why do I have to learn about the history of Mexico, my own people through an elective? Right. And I would go through my high school classes and history classes being like, where are the Mexicans? Uh -huh. Because because we learned about slavery and we learned about the civil rights movement and I would be very much, very important not to discredit, like actually learning about those things, even though I do have a problem with how like they've been taught because they're very, um, very like the civil, uh, so slavery ended and, and that was it. And then like a hundred years later, civil rights ended, started and then ended and then that was it. Um, but I would think, um, particularly because I'd be like, I did know history. I read books and I was just like, the Mexican 
Amer- the Mexican American Revolution happened, and Mexico's always been on the border. So I know there had to be some relationships. So where are the Mexicans? Uh, and I knew that California and, and Texas had been full of Mexicans, and then they were like basically annexed t- into the United States. So where were the Mexicans? Uh, and then because of that, and because I had a basic understanding of geography, I was very much like, well, during the civil rights movement, I know that I, if I lived through the civil rights movement being Mexican, I would not have been treated as such. So where are the Mexicans? Uh-huh. It was very much about where the Mexicans were. I, it wasn't until later that I should have realized they should have been where the Latinos. Uh-huh. Um, so but then I remember the history major when you went to Rutgers. Yeah, I did. Um, what did I you, very... Was that your major that you graduated with? No, it was not. Well, no, it was. It was. Um, I was very, I, so I came to Rutgers and I did terribly my first semester. Uh, I, I wanted to still be a teacher, but I took intro to education and I failed. Uh, and I also failed another class, uh, another history class. Um, I was very depressed that semester. I was really lost. I was very much, um, I didn't know what I was doing. I lost motivation. I was very, um, It's that thing that happens where like you've been an A student all your life, but then you go into college and, but you you really like, you're an A student because no one's really like pushing you to be more. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I got to college and I wasn't an A student, I felt really demoralized. I also was very lonely because like all my friends were white, white people um, who, and that also were going to college who were very much not understanding why I was upset or why I didn't understand the resources or why I, um, so I was very lonely. Um, and after that, I really questioned whether or not I wanted to be a teacher mm-hmm. um, because I had failed the very class intro to education that I was, that was like, uh, so I ended up looking through the catalogs of Rutgers, one of the few people who probably have looked through the catalogs of Rutgers uh, courses, and I found um, epidemiology. And I had known what epidemiology was because at the time, and to this day, one of my favorite movies of all time is Contagion, which ironically deals with um, a global pandemic hitting the United States and people mm-hmm. dying. Mm-hmm. But it very focused on like the CDC and epidemiologists and the World Health Center and like kind of like put them in a very good light. Uh-huh. light. And um I was like, that's so cool. But like back then I was like, no, still teacher. But I had thought about it. And so I had seen a course, uh, Intro to Epidemiology in the catalogs. And I was just like, well, that sounds, maybe I should revisit this this wild fantasy of like two months um, in high school. And, uh, but I saw that the prerequisite was, um, it was like pre-calc and um, introduction to public health. And I was just like, well, I can't just enter the class apparently. And so I decided that summer, the first summer of, um, of my records career that I would take introduction to public health, just to, just to feel around, just to really know what I wanted, if this was even a thing. And I took it, I took it with Professor Talbot. Um, and I remember just falling in love with it. Uh, not just the epidemiology part, but like the entire field. I, I really didn't realize how all-encompassing public health was, uh, mm-hmm. which, it, um, and and so after that, I I, it was it was a, it was a no-brainer. I just decided I was going to take public health. Uh, I decided to keep my history mostly because I still loved it, um, and because the dream now is really um, to be an epidemiologist, uh, do all I can with it, and like around the age of fifty, retire and become a teacher again. That like that's the dream. Uh, so you double majored in history and public health then. And, yeah, and I minored in Latino and Caribbean studies. And were there a lot of uh, Latinx people at Rutgers when you attended? When I first attended, I would say no. I didn't notice them. I, I really didn't notice them. They were there somewhere. Uh, clearly now I know, but uh, I did not notice them, mostly because my first year at Rutgers, I stayed with, like, I didn't, tr- I was a commuter. I was a commuter the entire time. So, like, it's very hard to get to know people or Rutgers community um, better when you're a commuter because you're, you're just there for class and then you leave. And so I hung out with my high school friends, but um, something happened with those friends. Uh, and I, it, it was a whole story that I'd rather not get into. Uh, but um, they, uh, my junior year was when I decided to stop doing what my friends suggested. 
uh, I stopped doing what my guy, my my people who at Rutgers suggested, and I took introduction to Latino studies with Professor Aldo Laria Santiago, and that is the first time I remember being like, oh, this is where all the Latinos are, and it was really funny because like I would go into that class and I was just like they like I was taking history classes up until that point and education classes and they were mostly filled with like white kids um and I took that class and I remember like that all the Latino kids seem to be in engineering um which I didn't even think about being a thing um and that's that's when I remember thinking oh this is where all of y'all at um mm-hmm. and then and I think that's actually how I ended up sticking well Professor Laudia gave me a job and I loved his class so much that I took another class with him the next semester, which was uh, the history of Mexico, which was the first time I learned about my Mexican history. Mm. Uh, And that's where I met some of my closest friends, but um, that's where I met the people who I ended up starting the Mexican American Student Association, MASA, with. And uh, since then, like, yeah, I've seen Latinos everywhere, but that's usually because like, I had to like, incorporate them into my education almost uh, because through the latino uh department the latino caribbean studies department um and in my history classes i would say that i saw less latinos it was very hard to find latinos Mm. granted i might suggest that i might have been taking the wrong classes i've been told because i was not taking classes like that were dealt with like more like ethnic or like historical things historical like about like minorities. Mm -hmm. I was taking like history of corruption or like classical history, uh, which now I realize I shouldn't have been taking because those, well, history of corruption was actually pretty interesting, political corruption. Uh, But uh, yeah, no, so like that's where I I found all the Latinos. I was kind of sent, kind of also made the Latinos come to me and when I helped create uh, Masa because, well, of course, all the Latinos are going to show up. To, well, all the Mexicans are going to show up there. That's where, yeah, we kind of created Masa after that. And we were all very much, but in the class, we, uh, it was me, Gabby, Danny Morales, and Neda Perez. I, Gabby's last name, I don't remember. Don't, I can't pronounce it and I don't want to butcher it. Uh, but uh, we would look at each other and we would like, be like, why is it that we had to take history of Mexico to find other Mexicans? Mm-hmm. Um, because we weren't the only Mexicans. We were just the four that like stuck together. Um, but yeah, no, um, it was very interesting. The thing also was very much about the fact that like, I had a warped per- perception about what Latinos and, uh, were because of my experiences in high school and the Puerto Rican students there. Um, but it was very much like, it very was helpful to me to like witness the breadth of what Latino meant at Rutgers. And what year did you co-found MASA? So we co-founded MASA this fall 2017. Okay. Um, And what was like the, like the, what kind of work did you all do as an organization? So a lot of people assume that we were um, created as a response to uh, the Trump presidency. Um, That is a false statement because what we really wanted to do, uh, we were started because Danny Morales um, was a very kind soul. And that fall uh, semester, there was, an, there was two earthquakes in Oaxaca and Puebla that hurt a lot of people and needed a lot of help. And Danny Morales wanted to fundraise for it. Uh, but the thing is at Rutgers University, the only way you can fundraise on campus is if you are part of a student organization. So he went to Professor Lauria Santiago, who was m- my boss, and who for the longest time had been pushing me to do something mm-hmm. like this. Uh, and he asked him for advice and Professor Lauria said, you had to start a student organization. You had to start MASA. Mm. Uh, and so a lot of what MASA did the first year was fundraise. Like we were very much about fundraising about um, uh, for um for Mexico for like the the earthquake, uh but then we also sat down, and uh, I remember taking pictures of the first meeting where we all sat down and we all kind of like talked about it like we we um I didn't have really friends but like Gabby and Danny and Nada brought like all their Mexican friends because Danny Morales is from New Brunswick, 
Mm-hmm. And so he knew all the Mexican kids because he had gone to high school with most of them. Um, and then like department helped a little by sending out mass emails for all the Mexican kids. Uh, Gabby helped as well. Um, and we all sat down and we all kind of talked about what we wanted, what we wanted to see a Mexican organization at Rutgers do. And so a lot of it was like uh, bring up higher numbers. Uh, and the idea was floated around of like creating a scholarship for Mexican students to come to Rutgers. Um, very much, much, a lot of it was like about teaching, uh, teaching ourselves about our own culture because a lot of us realized that like, we hadn't, outside of our families, we hadn't been taught our culture. We hadn't been taught our Mexican history or American, American, Mexican American history. And so a lot of like what Masa did the first year besides fundraising was have events that showcased representation of Mexico uh, and showcase and like teach actually like the history of Mexico and like aspects of Mexi- uh, Mexican history. Like we had our day of the event, uh, de- day of the dead event mm-hmm. was one of our first events. Uh, and we dedicated entirely to what actually the day of the dead was. It was a little bit of a lecture, which we learned to not do anymore, but um, because people don't want to lecture after lectures. Uh, but that's a lot of what we did. We we educated a lot of like what we wanted to do was also community service. We didn't end up in the first two years, three, yeah, in the first two, three years of the organization, like I would say that that was one of our biggest challenges. Mm-hmm. And to an extent, we, because like to an extent like that, service part was very um activisty part of masa Mm -hmm. but the problem was that a lot of mexican students had jobs and had uh, a lot of responsibilities and to be an activist at Rutgers is a very time consuming job and a lot of students did not have that time to do those kind of things but everyone wanted to so that's like a lot of like the first year and you were also a part of Undocu Rutgers as well. Yeah, um, for a semester. Can you talk about what Undocu Rutgers um, is and what happened during your time when you were a member? Okay, so Undocu. So I only know like the brief, a brief history of Undocu Rutgers. Undocu Rutgers started about a year before Massa. Um, it was started. It started by three students. My understanding is uh, Sergio. Karimer and Josue. Um, and it was really in response to the deportations that were happening at the time, to the uh, a response to uh, President Trump's um, verbal attacks against the Latino uh, undocumented community. Um, and so they, at the first year from 2007, 2016 to 2017, I know they led marches um, against um, the the getting rid of DACA um, and uh, fourth sanctuary uh, status at Rutgers. Um, and then there was a, a march because the leader, the president at the time, uh, the main main, uh, Kairi Med, was um, specifically targeted for deportation even though she was a DACA student. Um, and uh, there was a whole entire march that happened in Newark for her. Uh, that was the spring semester of 2017. Uh, but I wasn't, and then Masa was created, and that's how I got really involved with them because they were very supportive. Uh, Josue was one of the um, co-founders. Uh, he was Mexican, um, Karimer was Dominican, and Sergio was is Portuguese. Um, so Josue, being Mexican, he uh, he came to the first Masa meeting. He came to many Masa meetings, and so I decided because I had been voted vice president. Actually, I wasn't voted vice president. I was just made vice president. Every other person, a lot of other people were like voted in. I was just made president, vice president. Um, so I uh, would go to Undocu Rutgers uh, meetings to um, to support them because I, I thought that like, we were very about keeping relationship good, good relationships with all student orgs, uh, particularly in the Latino, uh, council under the latino council um so i we all kind of like dedicated ourselves to a org and i decided to do undocumented records because um my i remember the struggles that my mom had gone through being undocumented 
and I also remember um, I, I had a, uh, one of my cousins uh, who was about two, he was a year younger, so five years younger than me. He was undocumented. And I, I remember seeing the struggles that he had to go through uh, at school and the lack of motivation he had uh, to finish school because he, um, he was undocumented. And so he was very much like, what's the point um, if I can't go to college? It's, college is not a possibility for me. Um, and I remember that starting really young. Uh, so I was just like, well, let me, how, how do I support undocumented people? Because I'm not undocumented, but I have seen it in my community. And, you know, I just wanted to be a good ally. And so I went to their meeting. I got, I got close to um, uh, one of the co-founders and he was graduating. Um, and so I, stay, I, st I stayed connected to undocumented workers. I helped a lot uh, where I could um, and, um, I would go to their marches um, and that's how I made a lot of my activist friends because like uh, the USOS kids would be there, the unions would be there um, and so I would go with them to um, their their marches as well to like support or to like show up. Masa was very much about uh, showing up for others. Mm -hmm. We believed in that. We believed in solidarity. Um, and at the end of the year I decided you know Andaki Rutgers um, was a very small but very passionate group. So I decided to join them for the following year, but that was also the year that I became uh, president of the Mexican Student Org. Um, so the year I, it was, what was it? 2018, fall 2018, uh, I became their liaison. Uh, so I became a part of the e-board. Um, a lot of, a lot of what, Undocumented workers at the time had been focusing on was creating a permanent position for a counselor uh, to be uh, at Rutgers. And mm -hmm. there was uh, at the time uh, a counselor that was for undocumented uh, students that would travel among the three campuses, Camden, Newark, and New Brunswick, but that was very taxing on her. Right. Uh, and it was very like, very much like not fair in a sense, because like the largest undocumented community, to my understanding, was in Newark, which that meant that they needed the most help. But they didn't mean that New Brunswick didn't have kids that should also be looked at. But then like Camden also. And so the idea was that they wanted to um, make her position permanent, like because it was by contract. So like it, she had to renew it every year. But like they were like, no, 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 we want it permanent, like guaranteed that she will have a position. Um, there also was one lawyer at Rux, there still is one lawyer and there still is, I think, yeah, there's still one lawyer, but like uh, the position was made permanent, I think for Newark, but it wasn't made per permanent for New Brunswick. It, and in Camden is still having a problem, mm -hmm. um, I think. Um, and so there was very much about that. They wanted to make actually a whole department. So like there's the cultural centers, they kind of wanted a cultural center type thing for undocumented students in New Brunswick. Um, and so that's what a lot of the campaigning was uh, during my time as liaison. There was also a problem with like, no, it wasn't a problem. What they wanted to do was they wanted, so I, undocumented, especially in New Jersey, but I think also like in, uh, nationally, the problem is, and that undocu Rutgers felt was the problem, was that the term undocumented seems to be very associated only to Mexicans and to an extent only to Latinos. Uh, which obviously is not true. So undocumented workers also very much that semester was focusing on broadening their like their their image as not just Latino. Um, so every uh, week we would go to a different cultural center to meet there to um, kind of very much um, show that we are we are multi multicultural. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a lot of the focus. And um, I left on Rutgers that after that one semester, um, mostly because my responsibilities towards Masa were overtaking it. And then I was also graduating and I knew that if I, I wouldn't make it if I was in both student orgs and I obviously would have a loyalty to Masa beforehand, but also mm -hmm. very much because um, there was this very, tension uh, in, within Andaki Rutgers, where um, sometimes it felt that um, 
obviously it's true that we need to put the voices of undocumented students first, but at times it felt like uh, undocumented students were the only voice and that anyone not agreeing with that voice or had a different opinion or second opinion wasn't very much um, taken into the same weight, which I, I understand why, but it was also very like demoralizing in some ways towards me because I was very much like, well, why am I here if I cannot have a, a weighted opinion? Um, I also at times did feel that um, some goals were very unrealistic or they were not the good uh, best approach to a particular problem and so i ended up leaving on docu records uh, but uh they are still they are still around and they are still going strong and you know i i think it was like the best choices because on docu records then chose more people that like had the same line of vision mm -hmm. and i they have accomplished a lot since mm -hmm. yeah Okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit sure. and talk more about the pandemic, the current pandemic that we're in. Um, and yeah, so this next portion will be primarily about the pandemic, but it'll also be interrelated to a lot of the, the stuff you've been talking about previously. Sure. Um, so first off, how did you first learn about COVID-19? The radio, TV, social media? social media it had to be social media because i i don't exactly know if i fall as a millennial or a generation z i say i'm a millennial um but others have argued uh so i but i'm a, but such to the point is i'm attached to my phone uh and i'm attached to my social media and so i remember it being um an article i think from cnn or it might have been new york times but the cnn um that was talking about an outbreak in uh, Wuhan, China. Um, and I remember thinking that, that it was so interesting because I, I, I study epidemiology. Um, I, Contagion was my favorite movie. Uh, I had learned a little bit about the SARS outbreak. Uh, and I just thought it was really interesting. But at the same time, it was very much like in the back of my mind, because like I was entering grad school. Uh, I had friend problems, I had uh, family problems, I had boy problems, I had everything. So like, it was very much like at the back of my mind. It was also very much about like it happening in China, but like the world yet hadn't been taking it seriously. Uh, and at the time, because of all the other obstacles of my life and grad school, um, I had stopped paying attention to the news. If this had been a year prior, I would not, I would have realized a lot sooner that it was more important to be paying attention than I was. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it was through the news. I remember thinking it was like so interesting. And I thought, I remember like bookmarking the articles and like reading through them and like reading like the case fatalities and like doing the math of like the survival rates and all those things, just because those are the things that are interesting to me as uh, epidemiology uh, student. And so, yeah. I, I remember it being like something that has passed through my uh, feed and then it wasn't until January that um, it started being a bigger deal to me because uh, I remember hearing it about maybe like early January, late December um, about the reports coming out of China, but it wasn't until January or early February that I remember it actually being an impact enough for like people to like actually ask me questions so a lot of a lot of my friends a lot of the Mexican-American uh masa um would come to me and ask me questions about a thing and the thing is like I wasn't an expert um uh, mostly because I was a student uh but I would always calm them down but then I remember that there was this one friend who came who we were talking about it and he and this was the first time I remember it actually me taking it seriously because he was talking about all the videos that were coming out of China or like the, I don't actually even know that they were real. I told him they were probably fake uh, about people like just dropping in China, just like dropping like flies. Uh, I remember seeing one of the videos where like someone looks sick and then they just like fell to the ground in the middle of like the street. Um, and I told him that those were probably fake because I, I would need to see them vetted by a news or, uh, organization before I took them seriously. Um, and that's the first time I remember it act actually taking it seriously. I remember and thinking like, it can't come here, right? That's the thing. Like I was very, I would say, naive about it, mostly because I had learned about pandemics. I had through uh, both a historical and a um, 
public health aspect. And I had naively thought that the United States could handle it. And to an extent, like the United States could have handled it, it under a different administration. Mm -hmm. Did have Do you have anyone personally close to you, like a family member or a friend who has gotten COVID-19? Yes. Um, um, oh, you're going to say something? Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, the first... Okay, so the first time I had heard that someone I, in any relation to me, had had COVID-19 was um, an intern from MASA. I'm very still close to MASA. Uh, an intern from MASA who I had taken uh, under my wing, his best friend had died of COVID. And I remember um, offering my sympathies. And that's the first time. And the thing is, the kid was like 21. Wow. Um, at the, I, at the time of his death. So I, that was the first time I think I remember like people around my age, particularly taking it seriously because this friend was obviously grieving his best friend. Uh, that's the first time uh, I ever took COVID in that kind of death, uh, that death aspect. The second time uh, was um, I had a, I have a friend who's I'm kind of close to um, we hadn't spoken in a month. So the first, the last time we had spoken was a week before spring break, which is the last week of classes. The classes officially ha were in session at Rutgers. And we were talking and we were, I remember being like the happy, one of the happiest days of my life actually. Um, but we hadn't spoken for a month and I had remember trying to contact him uh, repeatedly throughout the, the month that we hadn't spoken. Um, because I, I, I did miss him and um, I wanted to know how he was, but he wouldn't reply or he would be very short with his replies. Uh, I remember getting uh, actually angry about it. Um, and on April 10th, um, he, he sent me money that he owed me. And so I got in contact with him. And that's when he told me that he had had COVID the entire time. Uh, COVID-19, him, his little brother who I had met, who was an angel, and his mom. And I just remember sitting there listening to him just r like rattle off like his entire month thinking I could have lost my friend and I was angry. And so there's, there was that, that was a whole thing. Um, the next time I heard that someone I knew personally was uh, Professor Lilia Fernandez. Um, she had been one of my bosses at my time at Rutgers. Uh, she's also a professor that I hold very dear. I, I look up to her. Uh, I still work for her. Um, she, I hadn't heard from her directly. I heard from uh, one of the people who worked at the Latino and Korean Studies Department who I'm closer to. She told me that uh, Professor, and um, Professor Lilia Fernandez had been sick. Um, I remember um, really, uh, that one was really hurt too. Be, uh, not hurt, but like kind of like paralyzed me because like professor fernandez in my head was the kind of it's kind of like this invincible being um and the idea that she had gotten sick someone who's very careful who's very like informed had gotten sick was very um jarring to me uh i didn't get in contact with her until like maybe a month and a half later uh, mostly because i was told that um she wanted to be left alone and to be quiet uh not to contact her i was told to um, so I kind of waited for her to contact to contact me. Um, and also, she's a very apparently she's still a very busy person despite the fact that she's sick. Um, and so that was that was that. And then the fourth time that um, COVID kind of hit home, but technically speaking, further than any of the other three, uh, was actually about a week and a half ago, ten days ago, ten days ago actually. Um, my mother's aunt her father's sister uh tia maria uh lived in el de f and uh, the uh, the uh, federal district uh the capital mexico city uh and she had gotten sick and she had died and her remains were being brought back to cuyo tepeji to cuyo uh and there was a lot of talk about the family within the family about the fact that no one really wanted to deal with her body because they were afraid that they, if they dealt with the body, they'd get sick. Mm -hmm. But um, my grandfather is, I think at this point, the last living sibling. And in his head, there was no way he was not going to give his sister the funeral rights that she deserved. Um, so there was a lot of 
fear among the siblings of so my mother's siblings that my grandfather was going to get sick. Um, and he's obviously, he's like 86. Mm. So um, that was, that was a fear. I think that's still kind of a fear, but um, less so. Did your aunt have any pre-existing conditions or other health problems before the pandemic had started? My understanding is that no, she was just elderly. She was uh, an older sister, so she was above the age of 86. Mm. Um, they also, there's also the thing that, uh, from my understanding, is that Mexico, the Mexican government in particular, is not taking COVID particularly seriously. Mm. Uh, and they also, uh, and um, the problem also is that um, Oaxaca is, from my understanding, the second to last poorest state. Uh, because it's very indigenous. And um, so there's not a lot of protections for the people there. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of money for people to be uh, to this to the state, like to the extent that New Jersey is like doing contact tracing and doing like PPE work, at, uh, PPE uh, shippings and things like that. So like Oaxaca doesn't seem to have that. Um, and so there's like my, I know that like my mom's worried because like people in her small town are already getting sick. Mm. And being in New Jersey, which was uh, one of the epicenters early on, um, can you talk about how the pandemic, like the school closure affected like you going to grad school? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, so I think what it mostly affected was my mental health. Um, um, mostly because I remember losing motivation. Um, I'm, I know I know myself well enough to know that um, I might be an introvert, but I need human interactions. Uh, I used to say that my Mondays were the days that I dealt with my side, that I saw most of my friends, uh, and it's more sporadically throughout the week, but that I needed that dose to get, my, get me through the entire week. Um, and I lost that dose, and I remember that it was very, very painful for me for the first few first month or so that I didn't see my friends. Um, I remember um, being really sad and very lonely. Um, but um, so there was that aspect. Uh, and it was also the aspect of like, I felt, uh, I don't know if other people felt it, but I felt overwhelming like need to like, I felt like being overwhelmed by the fact that I realized I had a lot of people in my life that I would sporadically see and check up on, but naturally because like they were just integrated into my life, um, that I suddenly couldn't. And I was very, felt very much overwhelmed by having to contact all of them and like check up on them. And then the thing also was that very much that like, I would obviously ask them how they're doing. And then I would um, have to not deal, but like, I by asking them what how they were doing, obviously under the context of what like is happening, it would be almost like sharing their burden. But like a very the thing and the thing is also very much like unfortunate. This is this is a little my fault, I suppose. But like many of my friends, I have a very um, mentor mentee relationship with because I was always the oldest in Masa, um, and so like I I. I big sister them a lot, like to the, to a terrible extent sometimes. So like sometimes like in that kind of aspect, I was always the one doing the not the not that I don't mind either, but like the heavy lifting of like the emotional support sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was very taxing sometimes, uh, and then it would then I would do that for a while, and then I'd have to like stop talking to people after, for a week. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that aspect. There was also the aspect that um, I had my I. I, I need structure and so I had a set schedule and so like reforming my schedule was very uh, difficult um, because I would like my set schedule I have an eating problem sometimes where I forget to eat but my schedule as I had created it prior to the pandemic reminded me when to eat and when I lost that there would be a day sometimes where I forget to eat not not purposely just just I would forget and so like that became a problem very early on where I would be not I would accidentally be starving myself not remembering to eat because like that it was no longer working to my schedule um and and the thing is also I don't cook so like all my food before the prime pandemic was mostly out like restaurants um and so like learning to do that was a problem but it, but I handled it um 
uh yes uh, a lot of like um academically speaking um my grades i i was i will say that like i took two pretty easy classes i took three classes from a grad uh, start because i knew that i didn't want the same thing that happened when i entered Rutgers as an undergrad to happen when I entered uh, grad school because uh, as I've been told repeatedly, C's don't get degrees in grad school. Uh, and so I didn't want that to happen. So I took only three classes. Two of them were very easy because one was introduction to epidemiology. So I, I already knew it. And the other one was um, uh, bio computing biostats. So it was like uh, very like coding, uh, which I didn't know was easy, but it turned out was pretty easy for me. Uh, and the professor was great. Uh, too so all kudos to him um my biggest issue was an introduction to biostats but uh i was very fortunate that i had a friend i had made a friend a close and now a close friend and she um she helped me through it we we would zoom all the time before class after class the weekends uh in fact she was one of the few people that i i I will say that I didn't listen to the quarantining and I visited because we, we would not, we would not have passed the class if we had not had each other to constantly like motivate us and to constantly remind ourselves, like if I wasn't doing it for me, I was doing it for her. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, there was that uh, other than that, like the transition to online classes wasn't as difficult. Uh, the teachers were very, they, they adapted well, given the circumstances. Um, I will say that the, some of the problems were that like I would have no motivation, but I'd log into class and then I sometimes would fall asleep. I would fall asleep right in the middle of class because there was no one holding me physically accountable. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that those were like some of the difficulties very early on. Mm -hmm. um, and how has COVID-19 impacted you just like on the daily basis? Like what, is it, what are your days like under during the pandemic? Um, very early on I would sleep in late I would sleep in late um I was very depressed I will say that um I actually at, to this current time I cannot prove it but I think very early on a lot of my sleeping also might have been because I did have COVID I don't know actually if I had COVID I suspect it um mostly because I had been with that friend who did get COVID during that time at one point uh depending on when he got first sick and but then also because um I had um, I had headaches, I had fatigue, um, and then I had this weird. I couldn't smell things, and then I couldn't really taste things. Taste things tasted weird. Um, for like about a week, those symptoms happened, um, and then a little like the the smelling and the the taste kind of lagged on until like maybe like literally this month, um, and so I. I can't prove it because I haven't taken an antibody test. So like, I will say that some, some, my first few, a few weeks at, of the quarantine was very much about uh, dealing with those symptoms sometimes. Uh, very uh, sleep deprived, very unmotivated, um, headaches, dealing with a lot of those things. But then after that, a lot of it dealt with like, just focusing on school. Like most of like, up until like May, most of my attention was just on biostats because I because if I focus on anything else um and then getting in touch with my friends uh I would become really sad mm -hmm. and how has the pand pandemic affected like you or your family's like health care like access to health care um um so at first as of right now our access to healthcare hasn't. So my mother got laid off, and her, she was the most uh, by Rutgers, and she was she was our healthcare. Uh, she provided for the whole all six of us, the whole family. Uh, and so because of her contract and the way it was written, our healthcare doesn't end till August. Uh, so as of right now, we are fortunate enough to still have healthcare. Uh, in fact, uh, Monday, um, this past Monday. Um, we uh, started the process of applying for state healthcare uh, because we anticipate that we will not most likely have healthcare come September. Um, a lot of it, after after the quarantines, uh, some of the quarantine restrictions were lifted, particularly in the medical field. Um, 
in regard to dentistry, um, but we honestly the past few weeks have been us just uh, calling doctors and being like can we get an appointment because we want like my mom literally last week set up eye appointments for all of us because we we just don't know and um i have i've set up like my first appointment for the dentist in like years um just because we that's a lot what the health what our situation is looking like we don't know exactly um what's going to happen come August, September because we don't know if my mother will be re- uh, the, her layoff will be rescinded um, and so it's really just trying to use up our health care as fast as we can that way we at least have an idea of what is happening to our bodies um, my father due to his alcoholism um, had um, uh, a liver surgery because he has uh, cyro- uh, liver cirrhosis uh, and he has a lot of medication. So I know that like in the last two days, um, he has been, uh, him and my mother have been like talking about healthcare a lot and trying to figure out where is he going to get his medication um, in case that we um, we don't have the same healthcare. Because it, uh, another con- another thing we were look, um, I know my parents were looking at were, uh, was the possibility of staying with our healthcare and just paying the cost of what our health, current healthcare is, but I don't think that's feasible. Mm. Um, and can you talk about the fact, like, why Rutgers laid off your mother? Um, I could try to talk to about it to the best extent. The thing is, I don't actually. If Rutgers has an official storyline of why they laid off, particularly my mother, I have yet to hear it. Um. My best understanding is that they're just saying that they because they don't need the the stat. My best understanding says is that they're saving money by laying off my mother because of like obviously the record is going to go through a low enrollment period, um, and this that and a third they're lo- losing international students, they're losing um, money from uh, living on campus and the meal plans that they're going to have. So my understanding is that they laid off my mother uh, and her co-workers and about a thousand other uh, workers to save money. Mm-hmm. Um, if that is the case, I think it's a terrible case to be made. Mostly not because just Rutgers has like Rutgers has um, like funds for rainy days that they could be saving and they could be using right now as it is pouring, but also because they just hired about another thousand contact tracers including me uh to work for the state uh granted that money might be coming from the state itself uh to pay us but i i don't know i i honestly don't know why my mother got laid off i understand like that she um she's not going to be working because of the covid she's a, a a worker at a dining hall she serves pizza that's a very indoors high risk like situation for transmission for our diseases uh but i also don't understand but i don't understand why she couldn't just be furloughed that way we would have kept our benefits we could have kept uh the health insurance and sure if my mother wouldn't have gotten paid that way but uh we would have had something we would have had a, a, a another a less worry mm-hmm. um at times uh the thing is uh i have seeing the activist community at Rutgers, I have heard the problems of Rutgers. And at times I do feel that um, a personal opinion that may be accurate, um, that Rutgers fired my mother and fired her coworkers and the maintenance people and the uh, cleaning staff and the groundskeepers because they are the lowest of the, in, in the, the poll at Rutgers. They are the lowest workers. They are the ones that are paid the least. Uh, and they are mostly uh, African Americans, Latinos, minority. Well, uh, not minorities. Uh, more like black and brown bodies, essentially. Uh, immigrants at times. Well, yeah, immigrants. Um, and I on and not to make it dramatic, but I do think sometimes power, and in this case, power being Rutgers, likes to flex its power and likes to see where it can push. Mm-hmm. And you and I do think that. Um, they were they were the easiest to get rid of the first to get rid of because oftentimes these are the communities no one cares about and if something tragic happens to them well that's just life uh but i think it's because records wanted to see if they can push this group 
it will be easier to push other groups later on uh, because they are, from my understanding, going to push other groups if they haven't started already. I know they're going after tenured professors. They're going to go after grad students. They're going after almost all their workforce uh, to various degrees. So, which is why now, like, there's like 19 co- a 19 union coalition because everyone at this point is feeling the pressure of Rutgers. Right. My mother was just the first. And Rutgers is the research institute for Johnson and Johnson. And so it seems like they have funding for medical related um, research, such as you just mentioned, getting hired as a contact tracer. But yet at the same time, they're claiming like a fiscal emergency. Yeah. Um, And I know this is a message that has been fought by the coalition of unions and that you yourself are working a little bit with this coalition. Can you talk about that? So um, my mother got laid off sometime in early May. It was, give me a second. I think it was, oh, it was May 8th because it had been my friend's birthday the day before and it was right before Mother's Day. Um, And uh, after three weeks after that, was when I got a uh, call from Dr. DeSena, Carlos DeSena, uh, because the coalitions had mobilized. Um, And I was asked to speak on my mother's behalf as a student who has received tuition remission. Uh, Because the thing is the layoffs don't just affect the workers and their families, they affect the students as well. Um, And so I agreed. Uh, mostly because, so I don't have tuition remission anymore. Tuition remission is only for undergraduate students. Uh, as soon as you're a grad student, you're, the only tuition remission you could have is if you yourself are a full-time employee at Rutgers, which I am not. Um, and so the tuition remission no longer applied to me and it just finished applying to my sister because she had graduated this year. She was a 2000, uh, 2020 uh, class graduate. And so I decided, however, to still speak on tuition remission because of the enormous help that it had been for me. Uh, And the enormous help I know it is for current students who uh, work with it. Um, Tuition remission, I would say, is the reason I was able to graduate with two degrees, uh, well, dual degree. Um, And I don't, I, I, I just, there was this thing about on Twitter a few days ago where um, it said that students of color and black students often ha- times aren't just students. They are workers, they are student leaders, they are high school recruiters, they are the, the pictures on the diversity brochures. They are so many things that while white students are only students. And I will say that that is 100% accurate. But the thing is tuition remission allowed me to be just a student. Um, I ch- It was a choice to be all those other things for me because I didn't have to worry about money. And so the idea that that benefit is taken away from other students, I have a friend who is also now part of MASA who our mother works with a mine who was also laid off who now doesn't know her future, her senior year of, high, of college. Uh, she's not a high schooler. Um, And so I decided to speak on it. Uh, I did a press conference and I, it was very emotional. It was a very emotional press conference to me because um, I had spoken, I had cried about it. I had cried when my mother had been laid off. I cried that entire weekend. Um, But then when I started speaking to my friends, my peers about it, um, I was very relaxed, uh, very controlled. And I hadn't, I don't know what about the press conference triggered it, but I, I just, I started crying. Um, and I think it might, it might have been because like, I was one of at least what, seven people, maybe 10 people on that panel for the press conference. And I, 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 I don't know. I just felt like, how can this, these terrible things be happening to all of us? at the same time by the institution that claims diversity by the institution that claims revolution by the institution that claims to be for its students um 
And the thing also was very much about like, th- at the same time was when the Black Lives Matter protests really started popping up. And I think I felt very much um, upset by the fact that like Rutgers was putting out statements about supporting Black students and students of color. Meanwhile, they were firing their work, their most of their workforce that was of those communities. And I just very felt very upset. I felt very upset by the fact that this was the institution that taught me that to care about people, like public health is very much a, a service field. Uh, everything we do isn't for us, it's for the community. Um, my teachers instill that in me, my my work at MASA instilled that in me, um, that my work in the history department to an extent also did that as well. And here was the very institution who claim, who taught me to be for my community and how to be for my communities particularly uh, was failing the very principle that they had taught me. Um, and so I did that. Uh, I was very uncomfortable um, due to uh, f- some past traumas that, again, to be talked about in a different time, uh, not on camera. Uh, I'm very against being on the spotlight. Uh, I do not like my face uh, to be in spotlight. It's a reason why I was vice president and not president first. Uh, during masa so it was very it was very also frightening to me to have my face out there uh, i'm also come from a culture where we do not trust journalists uh we do not trust uh the media to portray us very accurately um also very much because in mexico if you talk to a journalist you end up dead um and so that was also a little like had to like get rid of that sentiment uh as well um but i decided to do it a lot because like again like by the very principle that that Rutgers taught me, this is not about just me. This is about my mother, but this is also about her coworkers. She has a lot of people who who do not know their future. Like my mother is lucky that her insurance ends in August. So we have time. One of my mother's uh, super uh, supervisors that was my mother, who also was on the press conference, like talked about how his insurance ends this month, the Jan- July. So like, it was very much about not me it was about others um it was about uh the the the, a friend who doesn't know her how her senior year is gonna look um and yeah so we did a press conference through tears uh and then i was asked to make a video although i i was asked to make a one minute video it turned out five minutes because as the people who will hear me know i if you let me talk i'll talk for hours um, but also I had a lot to say, like, it was very much about the fact that, like, Rutgers, this benefit did a great service to me. I can never repay the service that did for me. But it was also very much about the fact that, like, my mother was losing her job during a pandemic and she was losing her health insurance during a pandemic. And the the trauma of doing, of both of those things was very, like, cruel. And I had to say it. And I, and if I am giving the chance to say it, also the thing is, I very also recognize that uh, my pri- I have a privilege that I have the vocabulary and I have the historical reference to understand the context of what Rutgers is doing. Whereas my mother's more focused on her lot, job loss, I under- to an extent I understand like the social backgrounds of it and like the implications of it further than that. I understand that she's not just losing her health insurance, she's losing her health insurance for her entire family during a pandemic, during a time where the, where testing is free right now, but anybody testing is not. Uh, during a time where apparently if you get sick and go to the hospital, apparently it will cost you a lot of money. Uh, and that's with insurance sometimes. Um, and I also understand that the loss of insurance or like even with insurance, people go bankrupt. Bank- medical bankruptcy is a, a real problem that we have normalized in our society. And I also understand that while my mom sees herself as just losing her job, I also understand that like Rutgers didn't just fire my mother. She fired a Latina. She fired her, their Latino and black and um, brown uh, workers. So with that knowledge, I thought it was very important to speak uh, and to have my video shared. Um, I also understand that I, uh, to by accident, I really didn't mean to uh, have a lot of influence because I am, a, I, I still am, a student leader to an extent because I still have connections to MASA and I still have connections to other students and I still have connections to other orgs and I I like to think that um, that my time in service to them and time my time in service and as an ally has 
if anything, garnered me enough influence and enough support from those coalitions of students to show and to showcase my mother and be like, look, this is this is something wrong that's happening to her and her pop- and her community, her her workforce community, uh, and it's wrong. Um, and so, uh, if anything, not for me, but for her and for others. Um, and it's also for my brothers, like my brother is about, my brother just finished high school. He's also class of 2020. Um, and he's not going to Rutgers now, but he wanted to. He wanted to go to Rutgers. Uh, he, he's not going to Rutgers right now because of the grades, but he, the idea was that eventually he would transfer to Rutgers the way that me and my sister did one year away and transfer to Rutgers with the grades. Um, but that's not a possibility right now because we're very much worried about will my mother have her job in a year um my little my youngest brother wants to be a dentist and because he was raised watching me and my sister go to college me and my sister making our friendships and our community at Rutgers he already feels that connection he already feels that community he in fact sometimes cries when I don't take him to my student club, uh, student organization events. But he, in his mind, he is not going anywhere but Rutgers to be a dentist. But I, we don't know how to tell him that that's now a harder road to take. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I, it, it was something to be done. Um, I, since then, uh, also spoken to, to an NPR reporter, which was also trauma, not traumatizing, but terrifying. Uh, convincing the entire convincing the entire family to speak to her was also another uphill battle because again the journalism aspect of like the Mexican culture was very much against uh, the interview but um, uh, you put a microphone in front of people they'll speak Um, but yeah so like a lot of that has been that uh, sometimes reading my mother's union uh, emails uh, my sister's the one dealing with her unemployment benefits right now so you're all helping your mother try to navigate the, this process of losing not only her job, but her benefits um, during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I will say I've dealt mostly with the union things, although it's also very quiet with the union, um, Her particularly her local. Her local's not very, from my understanding, very commutative to what's going on, although they did have about two weeks ago, they were able to reach a deal with Rutgers, her local and another local, but it didn't include her. Uh, but they were able to like s- rescind the layoffs of like uh, 3,500, 3,550, there we go, 350 uh, workers. But from my understanding, they were mostly from the other local. Uh, and it was, it didn't include her. Uh, so I've been dealing with that. That's mostly my part. Uh, my sister's been dealing mostly with um, the unemployment benefits, mostly because like if one of us were to deal with everything, we'd lose our minds. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and in the healthcare, uh, my mother's dealing mostly with the healthcare, mostly because this is not the first time we've dealt with the state healthcare. In fact, during most of our lives, we had the state healthcare. Um, and it wasn't actually until like my father got really, really sick with uh, liver cirrhosis and needed surgery, uh, a liver transplant that we all decided to transfer into my mother to, to actually add the healthcare benefit, um, mm-hmm. which was ridiculous because I remember that um, my father had been sick for about a year and the, and like the, the, the I think it was like the Newark hospital um, that's connected to Rutgers didn't want to treat him or like they, they kept postponing the treatment but the minute that they switched over to my mother's insurance, suddenly there was a liver to be found. Um, mm. And so, uh, and, that, and then like, like that, like he was, he had his transplant and he was on medications uh, since then. So, uh, so she's dealt with the healthcare system, the state healthcare system. So she, so she knows how to deal with that. So she's, she's only asked us like on Monday, she asked us for all our papers because she hopes that with the family plan for the state that me and my sister will still be included with them. Mm-hmm. But I don't have high hopes for that because I think that after 21 in New Jersey, you are no longer qualified for the family plan of the healthcare system, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. And has your dad's um, work been impacted by the pandemic? No, my father, because of his uh, liver cirrhosis and his, um, he has to take a lot of medications. 
uh, he is currently unable to work, so he's already on uh, the, uh, I don't know if he's on disabilities or welfare or social security. He's mm-hmm. on one of them. I do not know. I really uh, don't speak to my father that well. So, um, mm-hmm. but he, so his work was not impacted. He, he's still always at home. So your mother pretty much was the financial support, the main financial support mm-hmm. for the family. Yes, uh, she. Yes, one hundred percent. Every but the house is under her name my my understanding is and you'd mentioned earlier that your mother used to send a lot of sent the most money back to family in Mexico um, Mm -hmm. out of her siblings is that still the case now um, since she's been fired Uh, yeah actually it it actually is I mean it's less frequent now Um, mostly because like technically speaking she's like one of 11 so like the other siblings do pitch in um and then I have an aunt who lives with the family, who lives with her uh, uh, grandparent, our, my grandparents. So she still like, they still help. Um, so she uh, she recently sent money, but she I think it was mostly because of my, my grandmother's birthday, and she wanted to make sure that like the I think she wanted to make sure that my, my her siblings weren't stingy on her birthday. Uh, so they, she gave money. She was like, go buy her a cake or something like that. But um, I don't know how the money situation is going. But from my understanding, that she's still like trying to give. She also gives to like an um, a uncle, uh, one of her brothers who is in uh, jail in Iowa, in Ohio or Oregon, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, from my understanding, she's still giving money. Mm-hmm. And has any like um, churches or local like um, community centers like been providing resources for you or your family? Like, have you all been accessing like communal communal resources from any institution? No, no, we have not. Um, so, no, I, I would say no. Um, I have been very fortunate in the fact that I, while I have lost most of my uh, income revenue, I have not lost it completely. So I still have money. Um, my sister as well, although she is now uh, wondering. Um, and my mother, technically speaking, workers was still paying her up until the, uh, her termination because um, they, she was, um, because after they, uh, after the, cafeterias closed they made they gave a lot of work to the uh cafeteria uh dining hall services people uh in housekeeping because they needed uh the manpower to um sorry i need to sneeze i don't need to sneeze anymore okay um uh they gave a, a lot of students had to leave so they had they needed the manpower to clean out the dorms and like bleach everything uh, so they were still paying her and then they would still continue paying her afterwards because she stopped after about a, a month or a few weeks because w- her supervisor and some of her coworkers got COVID. And so she was allowed to go home and because she was just like, my husband has uh, a compromised health uh, immune, uh, immune system. So no. Um, and so up until, up until her layoff, she was still getting paid by records. Uh, my understanding is, um, and now she's trying to get on unemployment benefits. So up until now, money has not been an issue, but I suspect that it soon will be. In fact, my understanding is, so I got the contact tracing job and I don't know how it's going because they're still in the hiring process and I don't, and it's very like, I feel like I'm very in the blue. I need to email them, but they're paying me 25 an hour and my mother was paid 18 an hour for her job at Rutgers. So my understanding is that as soon as I start getting paid and start getting, putting in the hours, I will be the highest earning person in my family. And most of the burdens I anticipate of the finances of the family will fall on me. And this is while you're still in grad school. Yes, this is while I'm still in grad school. Um, I am not doing summer classes right now, mostly because prior to the pandemic, I had anticipated that I would spend most of my summer working. Uh, I was, uh, I am a, a tutor for uh, SAT uh, high school level uh, at, in Edison. Although during, uh, prior to the pandemic, I was getting less hours because the SATs aren't really a thing during the spring. And I, but the anticipation had been that during the summer when most 
parents who want their students to prepare for 11th grade SATs, they send their, their kids to, uh, to, to the center. And I would have supposedly, I would have, according to my friend who got me the job, I would have been making bank, but uh, uh, because of the pandemic and because of how families are now strapped for money and because of families not really wanting their, their children learning through virtual way, um, there are, there's less hours, but there are now more hours during the pan during the first few months of quarantine, there was like, I was not teaching anymore. Mm. Um, but I have started reteaching. Um, and so, yeah, where was this going again? Um, oh, while I'm still in college. Yeah. While yeah. I'm still in grad school. Yeah. Uh, so with all of God's prayers, I anticipate that I will still be uh, in grad school come fall. I have looked at my financial aid. Uh, I have fainted over my financial aid, uh, but not really, but um, I anticipate I will take out a huge loan and go, continue my education during grad school. The idea is that I, no matter come high water, I will be, I will continue being in grad school. Um, my sister also anticipates me being in grad school because more now more than ever, I'm very lucky that um, my field, public health, uh, is particularly epidemiology, is in very much high demand mm -hmm. uh, during this time. Not, not one, of, one of my friends was very like, wow, you were very forward thinking. I was just, no, I was not. Um, it just happened to, by the grace of God, it just happened to be that way. Um, so, I, but I also realized that the job market is going to be very tough coming the next few months, coming the next few years. Uh, particularly for a recent graduate, so I will need the best high uh, step up that I can have, and as of right now, that is continues to be my master's, and um, I will finish it. Come high water. Mm -hmm. What have been some of your coping strategies for just like a daily routine, or like how you've been able to navigate just like the everyday during the pandemic Oof. so sometimes i wonder if i'm actually even coping well uh, to be honest to be perfectly honest sometimes i wonder if i'm coping really well or if i'm just distracting myself um i will say that um i have been very more kind to myself with the small things um i and and sometimes maybe every two weeks i'll be like you know what i deserve this and um but at the same time, like those things are very like about what I can do minimally. Um, prior to the pandemic and prior to grad school, I was very much a big spender. Um, and so, but lately because of the pandemic, uh, I tried to find ways to um, focus on like things that I can do that don't require um, the therapy that is money spending. Um, so, uh, I did for my birthday, buy myself some Legos that I thought I deserved. And I, I have been making those and remaking those. I, I will destroy them and remake them, uh, just to do something with my hands. I have been, uh, coloring. I do adult coloring books. Um, and so I've been doing that. Um, I have, I, I intend to restart as a coping mechanism because it has help, helped me before drawing. I like drawing portraits of people. Uh, the issue with that, however, was that a lot of the people I draw are, are friends and people I see. And so when I when I do them, um, I'll miss them. Um, but I'm trying to restart that. And it's also a lot easier to restart it now because like we're in a current state where we're, we're allowed to see each other again to an extent. Uh, maybe not to the extent that some people will be taking it, but to an extent. Um, so I'm trying to restart that. I've been reading a lot. Um, Ironically, the book I've re been reading the most is The Hot Spot by Richard Preston, which is about the Ebola outbreak in Africa, which is very in line with me. Um, but I've also um, been trying to, um, I, I think another coping mechanism particularly is like the Black Lives Matter movement uh, for me, uh, just because like, there's a lot of like right now literature going on about it. Um, not only that, but like a social media and like, a lot of like things to do for it and so like again like the idea that I'm helping others 
helps me in a way um just because it, it makes me feel more connected to a, a larger community um it also like grounds me a little like not that i'm not going through a rough time you know with like my mother losing her job and my own mental health issues but um it sometimes does help me ground myself to the reality that it could be worse uh and there are people out there that are significantly suffering more than i am um that's also why i listen to like podcasts uh a podcast that i listen to a lot is the daily but the new york times mostly because they try to be more um about the people sometimes um so they um they they have put out stories about the coronavirus and again that just helps me ground me to like the reality because i think sometimes like what does help me is that again because like sometimes i don't know if i'm coping or, dis or just distracting myself when i feel like i'm distracting myself it helps me to listen to these stories and listen to people suffering and that i need to remind myself to take this more seriously uh because i think that's sometimes a problem it's particularly in my generation that we forget that this is actually a thing that affects people mm -hmm. um and continues to affect people uh I, I, another coping mechanism i take walks almost every day uh usually evening tonight uh which my mom's not fond of but i do them um sometimes i'll take my little brother um, my youngest brother leonardo uh with me um mostly because he likes spending time with me and he's my favorite but not um but uh it also helps me because um uh it brings me back to uh, my teaching roots because my brother asks a million questions and i like to answer all of them as best as i can and so i'm there teaching him about like lgbtq rights or like um uh, health things I, I explained to him what a pandemic meant the other day uh he asked me well, has, there, has this happened before? And I explained to him the Spanish flu. I explained to him uh, the Black Death. I don't know. I, I should have mentioned HIV, but that's a little different um, in transmission, uh, not in pandemic size. But yeah, so like those kind of things um, mean, I think a lot of like coping mechanisms also include my little brother, um, mostly because we are close. Um, I did raise him with my sister, so like, well, sometimes the Lego building will include him. Um, sometimes um, we'll read with each other. Um, he's uh, we forced him to get into reading because we 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 like to remind him that he's building a future. Um, we, we watch TV together. Um, sometimes I've um, forced my family to uh, watch TV with me. Uh, we'll, like, we watch a lot of family action movies like Jurassic Park and The Avengers. Um, and so like those are the kind of things that like I guess our coping mechanisms, um, they're not always helpful. Like there will be times where like in the middle of the night I'll just be laying or walking around like my house um, wondering what is life um, and being sometimes a little depressed. Um, not uh, because it'll get to me. Uh, not just the COVID uh, things, but also the Black Lives Matter things. And then, you know, life, ironically, like with without COVID or without Black Lives Matter, still moves on, and it's still kind of like a lot. Um, and so, like, so, like uh, my friends have had drama since then, um, and there's other pro and other problems popping up. So, like, those things still get to me. Um, and then you know it's it's rough but it's i have to remember that in the grand scheme of my entire life this will hopefully just be a terrible but lighthearted chapter and what is your experience with um like when you go on your walks or um with mask wearing where you live like are a lot of people wearing masks has there been any have you have you encountered any issues with mask wearing Ooh, so in New Jersey, and particularly in the suburbs where we live, um, mask wearing isn't a thing unless you're going indoors to like a store or to like a shop. Um, for the most part on my walks, um, I go to the park or I go to the, sh uh, just walk through the streets of my suburb. And for the most part, I do not wear a mask during those times. I bring a mask in case I have to go inside a store but for the most part, I do not wear a mask. I, I am, however, 100% ashamed of it. Uh, I probably should wear a mask the entire time, uh, especially because I'm a public health major, so like, and uh, a master's student, so like, I should know better. Um, but yeah, no, I usually carry around a mask, uh, and if I'm doing like, and I, and, uh, but I don't wear it like if I'm like in the park, because usually also like, I'm like, 
significantly further away from other people. Uh, so I don't feel like the need to, uh, which again, maybe not the correct thinking. Um, uh, most of my masks, I wear the surgical mask, but I will say that I am not immune to trends and I am considering right now buying a fabric one uh, that's not disposable. Um, not that I'm disposing of the, the surgical mask either. Like I know that's also wrong. I know that's medically wrong, but I also because like I think I got used to like the at the beginning of the pandemic not having a mask like readily available to me. So like the surgical mask was the only thing I had available to me. So I would just constantly use that, even though that's not how you're supposed to use it. Um, so there's that. Um, although I did have a problem with that first, like the the capitalism that went behind the mask making of some of these like brands and some of these companies like forever 21 had a, a mask like american eagle had a mask and then like victoria's secret sent out a mask email when they finally had their masks uh, available and i just I, I had a huge problem with it but at the same time i understand that like labor went into it i suppose um so there was a, there was that kind of thing um but yeah, no, um, I guess the biggest, the only time that mask ever came up with an issue was like not on me, but it was my mother. She went to a South, uh, a, a Western Union to like give money to Mexico and she forgot her mask and she got kicked out and she got upset about it. But I had to be like, well, of, of course you got kicked out. There's a whole entire sanction to wear masks inside and doors. Like, of course you got kicked out. Um, and so like that, that's basically it. Mask wearing, I guess in New Jersey is very like laissez-faire um, to each their own. But at the same time, I will say that like, if you're like me and my sister went to the laundromat and we were wearing masks and there was this woman in there that was not wearing a mask. And I remember that me and my sister were like hardcore judging her. And definitely I will say like, granted, like I, right this is not the right way to go about things but like I definitely at least at one point gave her a dirty look I will admit and not my best moment but I think eventually like someone else complained to like the manager and told her to like wear to put it on like she had the mask the entire time apparently she just didn't want to wear it meanwhile we're in the laundry mag in close quarters uh and like there was a point where I was like well maybe she already had COVID and so like she doesn't she's not worried about it anymore but at the same time I'm just like no decency um but again yeah, it's one of those things um i think that in new jersey from what i can see like none of that culture war that has, ha has happened really like in new jersey for the most part i think i think also mostly because we dealt with like new york and like for a whole moment there there was like there was like no getting away from the fact that people were dying and we we would hear about the body counts and the over the, the overflow in the funerals and I even remember like driving past um Johnson uh Robert Wood Johnson hospital and there being a truck and then people were like that truck is holding bodies that are overflowing from the coroner's office so like I think that in New Jersey we had a very real sense of like no this is serious which is like lacking in like the south or in, in the midwest Mm -hmm. Now that um, New Jersey has begun to open up a little bit, have you noted, have you um, changed any of your behaviors in public? Mm, I would say, mm, mm, kind of, but not really. Like, I'm still taking my walks and I'm still doing the same behavior. And I will admit that maybe because I'm young and stupid. Um, as the saying goes, um, I during the pandemic and during the stay in home orders, I will say that I probably did not follow them to the T that I should have been following them. Not that I was out here like, you know, going to parties and stuff, um, like some people, but more like, um, more like I, I would go out and maybe visit a friend once in a while, like just to catch up. Like we'd say, I have not like six feet apart. Um, there was and yeah and so like i would visit a friend maybe once in a while um so and then now like the thing is i still kind of do that like 
it, to be honest, like I, most what happened was for the first time last week, I went and sat at a restaurant outside um, and I went to the beach, not to the beach during the day, like when there would be most people, like we, wa- we went to watch the sunset, which was significantly less, but not enough less. Um, and so it was kind of one of those things. Uh, I'm also, I will say like, I'm also very not an outgoing person. I don't tend to go outside a lot, uh, but I, I will say that like, since the quarantines have been lifted, there's an urge in me to go out and do what the things that are not allowed to do. So like amusement parks have been, uh, are expected to reopen um, in a few days and 100% I want to go to Six Flags. Um, the, uh, the mall was opened, I think last week and 100% I'm dying to get into the mall. And then uh, like, I'm kind of upset that restaurants were allowed, were going to start allowing people in stores this week, but it was canceled for Thursday or tomorrow, uh, mm-hmm. because of like the spikes that are happening in other States. Um, but I will admit that like, I can, I have been considered like going to a restaurant, um be, despite the fact that like i know like in my the public health in me knows that these are all bad ideas like transmission is not down we do not have a cure we do not have a vaccine these are all bad ideas i understand that mostly this is happening because we need to save to an extent the economy uh especially in new jersey because it's, it's, it's dealing with such a bad turn but like i know that technically speaking these are not things to be doing of uh, health wise um so there's this there's like this duality like where like i will consider things that i was not considering two months ago with like dealing with bigger crowds i will also say that ever since um going to the first protest back in like what was it the first week of june last week of the very end of may and being in crowds again, I will say that it was almost kind of like an itch I didn't know I needed to scratch. And since then, like, it's like been itching again. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say that like, I'm considering a lot of like, doing a lot of the things that are now allowed to do. Like, there was this one thing where I said um, that bowling alleys will now be open. I don't like bowling all that much, but now ever since then they said it, I, I sent it to my friends and like, when are we going? I did that and I, this is very much like that so yeah there are some things that I'm willing to like allow but like there are some things that I also will not do like ugh, there's like the Greeks some of the Greeks in our community in the Latino community like I know have been throwing parties like full-blown parties um makes with okay well it's 30 people at least but like that's not I would not do that I who am I trying to kill mm-hmm. And you mentioned going to a protest in June. What protest was that? It was, uh, and it was on. It was a Friday. It was, uh, the, it was the first Black Lives Matter protest that happened in New Brunswick, following the death of George Floyd. Um, we, it was the first time I had been in a crowd. It wasn't that big of a crowd. I fr- no, we got there around four to three. Um, and it started an hour later during that time of the hour we were all just sitting at the park uh, at a park in New Brunswick on the corner of Throp and uh, I forgot the other street but it's off of like uh, Paul Wilson Boulevard it's a school there um, Handy maybe I think it's Throp and Handy it was the corner of Throp and Handy um, and it was it was congregated there because that is the site of a killing of a African-American male by the New Brunswick police. I do not remember the name of the male, unfortunately. In fact, I, it was the first, me going to that person was, was the first time I had heard of this male, mm-hmm. but apparently he had been killed a couple of years ago. Um, but I went to that protest and uh, I remember it was like the first time I had seen some of my friends who I hadn't even gotten in contact with, some of the Massa people from New Brunswick, the Massa heads, Danny Morales was there. Uh, I remember this was the first time I accidentally hugged someone. Uh, I didn't mean to. Uh, he just hu- went in for the hug and I was just like, this is not something we're supposed to do. In fact, I didn't hug uh, Danny Morales uh, because and he was my co-founder. He's like one of the people I consider myself closest to through Massa, like just because we were just like, I think it would send a bad example. We're both public health majors. Um, so we just elbowed. No, we didn't elbow. He took my hand, which was not entirely the best. But uh, 
Yeah, no, uh, we went to that. Um, I was really, I remember really cons- being concerned about surveillance. So I told my sister to park some uh, blocks away. Um, and I, we went to it. Um, it started about an hour later. We marched up Handy through um, Paul Robinson Boulevard, up George Street, up until Albany in front of the train station. The, I remember the, the lead the leader being very charismatic, very about community, um, very about uh, very about moments of silence. There was also some indigenous parts to it. I believe uh, the community uh, organization uh, Lazos Unidos was help organized it. So they brought in some like um, native indigenous uh, spiritual um, elements to the beginning of the protest. Um, and then we walked all the way to the police station of New Brunswick. We stayed there for a while talking, talking about, talking about the, the men were talking about their experiences, uh, being black with the police. Uh, and then we walked all the way back to the park where we had started. Uh, in total, it might've been two hours. The, the actual process was probably around two hours. The waiting for the protest was an hour. Mm. Yes. And have you been to any other protests since then? Um, there was a lot of protests, but no. Uh, during I wanted to, but there were like some protests that happened that coincided with some like terrible things that were going on with my life and personal matters with uh, friends. So I was very, and then with the union, so I was very fatigued for a lot of the protests I wanted to go to. Uh, just mentally, uh, I was not in the right place. Uh, so the second protest that I've gone to was this past weekend, a whole month, almost a whole month later, uh, in North Brunswick. Um, and um, and the thing is, like, I, I've realized that, like, the first protest and the second to last protest, the, the second protest I went to, there was a whole time lapse of, like, events that within the Black Lives Matter movement that I think um, were very important and have really shaped me because I remember being very about the first protest and then the second protest I went to this past weekend, I had some issues with. Um, mostly because, so, like, since then, like, since the first protest and since the first Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of the conversation has shifted from not just being a protest about the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmaud Aubrey, but it has also fo- now focused on, well, what are we going to do about it? Um, and the thing is, like, I, um, because, like, while donating is great to bail funds and to organizations, and while social media is great up until it's performative, uh, the idea is, well, what are we going to do about it? Because it's still a problem. It's still happening. And so, like, a lot of the conversation has been moved to, like, abolish the police uh, and end the carceral state, uh, defund the police. And so the second protest I went to the past week, uh, it was in North Brunswick. And the thing is, North Brunswick has a very interesting relationship with the police department, where um, the police department is one of the highest paid uh, agencies within this uh, within the town. In fact, police officers from surrounding towns quit their jobs at their stations to work for North Brunswick because they are so highly paid. They are one of the highest paying police officers in the county. From my understanding, my sister worked for the Parks and, Re- uh, Parks and Recreation Center of Department of the, of, of the town. And she once told me that there were whispers about the fact that there were the that there was going to be bankruptcy within the schools soon and the parks and recs uh, department because they were paying so much money to the health, to the police departments north brunswick police are like racist as fuck like i 100 percent believe it i have technically speaking i myself have never had an ugly experience with them but i have had black my friends who are black and some of my friends who are latino and darker skin say things I have had friends at Rutgers who were driving past North Brunswick be stopped by the North Brunswick police. Um, there was a one point somewhere along the streets of North Brunswick, a Blue Lives Matter thing. And the street where the police station is in, I don't know who decided, but someone decided to play in a blue line in the middle of it. So with that in context I didn't like the protest the second protest I went to because it was very they did not talk about defunding the police Mm. they did not talk about like 
the problems. In fact, I had a problem with one of the speakers because one of the speakers talked about how basically kind of like um, the fact that like the police station keeps letting in bad people in and we see the bad people. And if we remove those bad people, like they would, everything would be better. We need to get good people in there. Whereas I am now in a state of mind where like the entire police structure is wrong. Uh, why do we focus so much on punishing people instead of like rehabilitation, uh, restorative uh, 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 kind of interventions? Um, and I understand, like you know, the woman, the woman who spoke, um, she talked about how she has she has family in law enforcement, uh, three three grandsons or something, and so I understood that like there's a very hard connect between that. Uh, to, to those kind of things but at the same time I was very much I did not like it I did not like the fact that we were not talking about defunding the police in front of the police station and um, the fact that we were still apparently in North Bronx the, talk, the talks were still very much about like bad seeds mm -hmm. um, whereas I am in a state of mind of like burn the whole thing down. And what other ways have you been involved at the Black Lives Matter protest besides um, going physically to protests? Uh, I have donated money to some of, uh, like to the uh, Legal Defense Fund for the, N, uh, the NCC, NAACP. Um, I have been, I guess like on social media to an extent I have been educating people or like been like posting things and been sharing my opinion. Um, I will say that those are mostly, I, I've also been like doing a lot of like self-educating kind of things, like, because like the thing is like, I understand that defund the police and uh, and abolish the police, abolish ICE, not abolish ICE to an extent, but like there are very hard sells to some people, who, especially in my community, uh, because the thing is like, not just my Mexican friends and my black friends who like are 100% usually for these these changes systematic changes but i also am followed by like still new brunswick people north brunswick people who like who understandably have a very good connection to the police as i said myself like the north brunswick police i have not had a bad interaction with um mostly again because i am pale um until they hear my name they do not recognize me as not white um i have been asked if i'm italian um so and it, and there's a big Italian community in North Brunswick, so like I get by. Um, so I try I try to educate myself because I I do I am prepared to defend these. I want to be prepared to defend these these ideas. Other than that, I can't say I've done much. Um, I do feel a lot of guilt about that, honestly. Um, just because. I am white passing and I I do carry that guilt of like not I I know I have not suffered enough like I I have like for example like my sister's darker skin than me she has been followed in the in stores like I have never experienced that um and I and like educating myself to an extent also very much about how to be a good ally has been very important to me uh although like I feel like I don't I have not garnered the enough to be tired like I feel bad when I feel tired about this um because like for example like on Facebook like you know people have been like uh, especially like um black people have right now felt this the space to open up about their own experiences and I recently learned that my one of my best friends growing up she was uh, she was african-american she is african-american she's still alive um apparently this it's a thing for her to whenever she's traveling abroad to look up how black people are treated in different countries uh, for her own safety, which is something I have never experienced. I've never thought the only time I ever thought it was when I was going to Spain and I heard that Madrid, people in Madrid don't like Mexicans. And that's the only time I ever considered my safety. Um, the only other times I consider my safety are like when like, my mom's just like, you know, Americans aren't liked everywhere. Um, but like to be, to have that level of like blackness is, it was very jarring to me. Um, so yeah, no, I, I try to educate myself as best as I can, but like, uh, honestly, like to be, I have never felt like what I'm doing is enough. Well, is there anything else you would like to share with me about your experiences with COVID that I have not asked about? Mm, I, I don't 
I don't think so. Um, I think the news has been overwhelming about COVID. Uh, I try not to watch the news anymore. Uh, I usually just watch comedians talk about the news. Uh, that's how I get my news source, that in like the podcast. Um, you know, it was really funny because um, for a time prior to COVID, like all, all the news would talk about was like the election. Uh, the primary elections, the elections, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, um, Warren, who was doing what. And um, I was so tired of it. I was so tired of it. And then when COVID happened, all the news would talk about was COVID-19 uh, COVID and all my podcasts were about no COVID-19. I would actually go back to the primary articles and I never looked to because I was so tired of it. And I would just listen to that for relief. Um, mostly because also it was in the past and nothing could be done about it. But yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't really know much, what else to say about COVID. It's very, I think it's very ironic, uh, a very ironic part of my life um, that the movie, the movie I loved so much growing up that I inspired me to do what I'm going to do for my life, for a career, is the very thing that's happened to me while I'm studying for that career. Um, I, I, I don't know. I just, I, not, not much else to say. I guess I hope that by the end of this, we all become better people and that I hope that, you know, it's the funny thing that about America is that like America and to an extent was prepared for this. It just completely, it, it just had a terrible administration in my opinion. Right. Um, because I had learned about how to deal with a pandemic because this is not the first time America has ever considered a pandemic only it was always under the guise of like bioterrorism and so that's why like in my head when like people were like first talking about COVID and like coming to the United States even when there was cases in Seattle I was not worried because in my head like I had been taught what we were supposed to do and and in my head like if we had had a competent administration it would have been done that way um so yeah no like i knew about the national stockpile and so like so it was like those other things but no i guess i don't really have much to say about covid i just i hope that like the end by the end of all of this we're all kinder to each other i hope that like we all fund public health better like the cdc better i hope we'll fund the national stockpile better um, and I also hope that like by funding those things better, I also mean that we continuously fund those things better because that's the thing about America is that like, we're very about like once an emergency happens, we're like, oh, we should fund this for the next time. But then like enough time passes that we're just like, it's not going to happen again. And so I just, I, I hope, yeah, I kind of just hope that the world changes for the better. Like I also feel like COVID has very much um, changed the individualism that some Americans have had before. Whereas like now, it, it it's for some people, I think for many people, uh, in particular in New Jersey, it has destroyed the idea that we're not connected in some way, that our actions don't affect other people. And I hope that continues. Well, thank you so much, Luz, for sharing your story and experiences with me. Um, yeah, of course. That's all I have. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording. Cool.